All right, now this is going to be a long night for some of you. And uh, if you, if by all you can take some good emotional evangelistic preaching, you're not going to get any of it tonight. So you're in the wrong place. <laughs> this is a Bible teaching tonight, Bible study. And I'll give you some good stuff tomorrow if you want some hot stuff. I'll preach for you tomorrow morning, tomorrow night. But this is Bible study. And it'll be a long, drawn-out affair for some of you, and some of you get tired of it. Because it's going to be one negative blast from one end to the other. It's just going to be negative, negative. I believe what, I believe what they call the power of negative thinking. <laughs> I believe nothing can be done without destructive criticism. <laughs> uh, I'm a vegetable farmer. I don't, I'm not a truck farmer or a community, but I'm a truck farmer from my own family. I've got ten homemade vegetable beds out of uh, lumber ties, or railroad ties, about 10 by 12 feet. And I grow 17 vegetables in the spring. and Eight of them in the winter, and uh, I, I, I know something. You can't grow crops without tearing up the ground. If you don't tear up the ground, you ain't going to grow nothing. So it's negative. Now here's a book. As you can see by my book, one of my German shepherds likes to feed on the Word. <laughs> he takes it literally, you see. And uh, this is uh, some book, this innocent looking thing here. Uh, I've read it through 150 times. I quit counting about five years ago, and I'm still going through it. I've never mastered it. I never will master it. I'll die before I master it. I don't think any man can master it. I don't profess to be a scholar. I'm a student. I'm a student. And this book here is the most uh, treacherous, dangerous, double-dealing, deceptive book I've ever read in my life. And I've read some. I've read a book a day since I was 10 years old. I've read at least 23,000 at a minimum. And this book, it's the greatest book in the world Amen. and the best book in the world. I recommend it before any other book, but it's the most treacherous, slippery thing you've ever got in your life. You realize that every false teacher in the world uses this book. Do you ever think about that? Every one of them quotes it. It's so written that it can use, be used to prove anything. So it's a dangerous book. But this book here has in it uh, the beginning and the end, and this book we're going to talk about tonight, we're going to cover about 100 verses of Scripture, and it's going to get heavy for some of you. It's going to get heavy, going to get dull, I'll be right frank with you. But then a lot of the Bible is dull. Some of the Bible is just dull as mud, you know that? Did you ever try to read through First Chronicles? What a drag, man, what a drag. <laughs> Did you ever try to read through Exodus chapter 20 to 30? With the tatches and the silver loops of the cell edge of the couplings, the two and a half cubits by and the blah, blah, blah. You wonder some more time what the world is going on. And I used to wonder about that at times. I don't wonder anymore. I know why it's there now. But it took me a good while to read through to get it. Oh, now this book here I've got in my hand is not a religious book. Now, that's the first thing. When they put this book in the library, they put it in religions, you see. But this book, I've read all kinds of religious books. No religious book begins talking about what to put in your mouth. This book begins with you eat this, you eat this, you don't eat this, you can't eat this, and if you eat this, and if you don't eat this, what a way to start a religious book. They don't start that way. I've read them, the religious books. They begin with deep discussions about the ultimate and the reality and the true being and contacting reality and yin and yang and the one and the two and the two and the one and the unite, all that bunk, see. This one here begins with two naked people in a garden. I need a very good start for a religious book. <laughs> two naked people in a garden, and don't eat this, and don't eat that, and don't eat this, and don't eat that. Well, here's this book here. You got one of these books here, turn to Genesis chapter 2. This book is a history book, but it has God stuffed all the way through it. And that's why they think it's a religious book. But religion, most religious books are not history books. They're books about philosophy and thinking and spiritual stuff, not stuff that goes on down here. This book here is a record of what went on this earth for 4,000 years, a record of it historically. And the trouble with this here book is, if this book is a history book, then what it says is going to happen is going to happen. Amen. And then when it talks about heaven and hell, that has to be history instead of religion. And that's what folks don't like about this book. 
The trouble of this book is this book says it's going to be this way, and then it comes. This way, and then it comes, and it comes. In history, not what you believe in your head. Yeah. Let, me, let me tell you something, folks. If you believe that Christ died for your sin was bread and rose from the dead, it wouldn't do you a bit of good at all. You'd go to hell yes, if, if he didn't. See? 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 See, what you believe is immaterial. You believe he died and rose from the dead. Well, I didn't know anything. If he didn't, well, he did or he didn't. <laughs> See? So the stuff I'm going to give you here in this book tonight, it's going to happen or it's not going to happen. And I'll say, I'm not, I'm not blush about it. You may think I'm being irreverent, but I'm not. I know the Lord and I know this book. And if what this book says is going to happen, then we're getting ready to get into if it doesn't happen, this whole book is a lie from start to finish. And I mean that literally. You say, well, where do you bet? You know where I put my money. I put it on the book. I'm betting it's true. See? All right, now, uh, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, let's begin at the beginning. Historically. We're not, it isn't, we're nothing here about getting to heaven, I'm going to read you. Nothing here about doing good or getting saved. Nothing like that. It isn't in there. Genesis 2. Genesis 2, verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, so forth and so on. Ten, a river went out of Eden to water the garden. There's no religion in that. A tree, a bunch of bushes, and water in the garden. Nothing about heaven, nothing about hell. No born again, no nothing. And here's a, here's a river coming out here. Verse 11 goes around Havilah. Uh, here's gold in the land. What's that got to do with religion? Nothing. <laughs> Thirteen. The second river is Gihon, Ethiopia. The name of the third river is Hiddekel, that goeth toward the east of Assyria, and the fourth river is Euphrates. Where's the religion in that? There isn't any. It's a piece of dirt. It's called about a piece of ground. Now you see where he says Euphrates there, and Assyria there, and Ethiopia there? Those are places that are on the ground. It got nothing what you believe. If you didn't believe them, it'd still be there. Now well, here's this piece of ground here in Genesis chapter 2. And then God calls a fellow, a, a goat herder, a sheep herder, Genesis chapter 15, and calls him out of Ur of the Chaldees and says, I'm going to give you a piece of land. It's a real estate deal. Genesis 15. It has nothing to do with believing anything. It's a real estate deal. I'm going to give you a title deed to a piece of dirt. Genesis 15, verse 17. It came to pass when the sun went down, it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace, and a burning lamp that passed between the pieces. And the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. That's an agreement. Unto thee, unto thy seed, I have given this L-A-N-D land. No heaven, no hell, no golden rule, no Ten Commandments, no nothing. I gave you a piece of land. From the river of Egypt, that's the Nile over here, to the great river Euphrates, right up there, like that. And then he names all the people in that place and says, I'm going to give that to you. Now that's what you call an unconditional covenant. You know what that means? And there are no conditions attached to it. When the Lord says, I'm going to give you that piece of land, that means he gets that piece of land. Right. See, what if he doesn't behave himself? That's not even there. The guy's asleep. Look at verse 12. He's asleep. There are no conditions to make. God doesn't tell that fellow, if you do this and this and that and this and that and this and that, you do this and that and that, yes, sir. Okay, I'll give it to you. It isn't there. The guy's asleep, and the Lord says, I'm going to give it to you. Now, that's this piece of land. It's this piece of land, this is called the Middle East. That's where history begins, and that's where history ends. Right there. So what about North South America? They don't count. You saw about your Asian Africa. That's incidental. It begins right here. Now, you see this thing here? I'm drawing you right here. This thing here is a piece of land, and he says, I'm going to give you from the river of Egypt to the Euphrates. Like that. And he said, he planted the garden eastward of Eden, and in Eden, that is the Euphrates. There it goes. And the east, to the east of Assyria, is Hiddekel. That's the Tigris. It goes right there. Then he names two more rivers. And one of them goes to Havilah. 
and Havel is down in Arabia. One went down this way. And the other goes to Ethiopia, and that have to go down this way. On this map, Ethiopia would be off in here someplace. After the flood, two of those rivers are gone. You can't find where they are. But when they went to Kuwait, and here's your modern map of the same area, when we went to Kuwait and bombed out the ragheads, we were dumping bombs around here, and the airplane began to fly up around here and fly around the Arabian Desert. And when they went across here and made photographs, they found two riverbeds down under the sand, going across the sand. Now, religion is not a point. If you're an atheist, fine, make yourself at home. I mean, just pretend God didn't do it. Well, then who wrote about it? Somebody knew, must have known about it. Whoever, whoever wrote the thing must have known about it. I wonder who could have done that. All right, now, if that thing is eastward in Eden, you know what that means? That means Eden is this thing right there. There it is. And eastward's over there. Now, you know that Bedouin I told you about that he called out and gave that land to? He came from Ur the Chaldees. That's right there. You know that isn't a modern map? It's Kuwait. History is going clear around the globe. You're back now from where you came from. You can't go a foot further. You know what that means? I mean, history is about over. Oh, and I see a thing right there, Ur of the Chaldees, that's where Abraham came from, right there. And if the garden was eastward in Eden, then this thing here is Eden. And if you've got a garden eastward in Eden, then it's down there in that corner. And that means that if you're messing around here now, you're messing around in Genesis 2. Well, you can't go further back in Genesis 2 or you're in Genesis 1. So history's all over. Bye-bye, good night gone. Your time, the second coming of Christ now, is so short, boy, you can hardly catch your breath. And not because of anything you believe. The problem is history has got you back where you began from. That's the problem. Now, is that strip of land right there? That is some piece of land right there. It's the thing I just drew right there. That's the land grant that God gave to Abraham. It ain't just Palestine. It's clean to the Euphrates River. And you pick up your Bible, read Ezekiel chapter 40 to 48, and you know what you'll find? In the millennium, when Christ comes back, there's Gad, Asher, Dan, Naphtali, Zebulun, Issachar, Reuben, Gad, Judah, Benjamin, clear across there like that. That's called the Great Arabian Desert in there. And the Bible says when Christ comes back, the desert will blossom like a rose. That's that's the desert. That isn't irrigation in Galilee. These prophetic expositors keep trying to shove you up and shove you up and make you think that it's, the stuff's happened when it hadn't happened yet. The Lord put it that place that goes into the roads. And now what God calls Abraham out of the Chaldees, he calls him out of here, and he goes right up here. And Haran, his daddy, dies, and he comes right down from Haran and comes right down cheer, and he lands right there. That's where he lands. And that's called the land of Canaan in the Bible, not Palestine. Canaan. Palestine, not a biblical name, that's a Roman name. You'll find that thing in Exodus 15, Palestinia. That comes from Philistine. Palestinia, Philistines. That they, God doesn't call it that, it's the land of Canaan. Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be to his brethren. Cain comes from Ham. You know, this land down here is called, uh, down, off down here in your Bible in Psalm 105, it's called the land of Ham. That's Egyptians. You know what Arafat is? He's an Egyptian. He's not a Palestinian. His uncle was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem in 1929. He's not a Palestinian. He's a liar. You know what his wife is? <laughs> How come you folks got computers don't know anything? What, what is your problem anyway? I mean, you start pushing them buttons, got the internet and the web. You don't know what the world you're doing. You don't know Arafat's wife? He goes to mass with her when he's able to. She's a Roman Catholic. Why, Muhammad said kill him. <laughs> Arafat's not much of a Muhammad, the Catholic wife. You know what the Catholic Pope said in the Crusades, 1100, Pope Urban? He said, they're infidels. Kill them and you die in battle, you go home to glory. 
And he got a Egyptian married to a Egyptian Muhammad, married to a Catholic. My, 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 my. What a thing. Oh, now see that mess right there? Look at here. Oh, no, lands up in here someplace. Mount Ararat. When he gets out of that ark, the Lord says, Okay, buddy, Shem, you get all that. Everything from there to the Pacific Ocean you get. That's Shem. You see that one there? Okay, Japheth, everything that side of the line, European and Caucasian, you get that. You see that line right there? Yeah. That's right. Ham. If he's in the northern part of the equator, northern hemisphere, he settles toward the equator. If he's in the southern hemisphere, he settles toward the equator. Shem, Ham, and Japheth, off that way. That thing's laid out like that, and that is, as far as God is concerned, that's just about the only place on this earth. It begins there. It, you know where it's going to end? Right there. You know where Christ died for your sins? Right there. You know where he's coming back? Right there. New York is not a factor. Beijing doesn't count. Moscow doesn't. You've been watching the boob tube. And now we take you, it ain't going to take you nowhere. It begins and ends right there. That's called the city of the great king right there. I used to wonder about these things. I read my Bible, you know what it say? The Lord say, my, this land here, this land here, Palestine, is the glory of all lands. Oh, rats, I don't believe that. <laughs> Did you ever see Austria? Did you ever see Germany? Did you ever see the Smokies in the fall? Did you ever see the Rocky Mountains? What do you mean that's the glory? Well, that thing's a goat pasture. <laughs> Why, you ever see the poly? You ever see the sun come up with a poly in Hawaii and that pea green water and that coral reef out there? You ever see I've seen them. I've seen the sun gone out over, set over Yokohama, uh, over uh, uh, Mount Fuji in uh, Japan. I've cut bamboo out there in the, in the, in the, in the bamboo thicket, those dukes over there in Corregidor and Bataan. I've been around a while. I've been around the equator 80 times, plain fair, 80 times. I've been up in there long enough to see go with sore feet. <laughs> <laughs> And the Lord says, this thing here is the glory of all lands. Well, why? Amen. Yeah. It doesn't have any mountains like the Rockies. It doesn't have any rivers like the Missouri and the Mississippi. It doesn't have any, any, any uh, uh, field, uh, streams of trout and stuff in it. And that dead sea, a bird dropped dead, going on that thing, flopping and faint, and hitting that water, that salt water. Why do you say that? Well, after I've read the Bible through a few times, I found out. I uh, found out a man's interested in his son. Amen. And the first time love shows up in the Bible, it's a man sacrificed his son, Genesis 22. Ladies, I got bad news for you. The first time the word love shows up in the Bible has nothing to do with love for a man for a woman. Yeah, amen. Or a woman for a man. Amen. It had to do with a man's love for his son. Amen. Genesis 22. And God's interested in whatever is connected with his son. And that land is connected with his son. So as far as God is concerned, that's the most important land on this earth. He calls it my land. He calls it the promised land. He said it's the Jew land. He said it's the land of my people. I'll give you the references here in a while. Oh, about 200 times he says it. Well, uh, let's turn to your newscast tonight and see if you can find that anywhere. Where do you find a newscast that that land belongs to God? They said that city should be an international city. Uh, Armenian quarter up here, Catholic quarter down here, Jewish quarter down here, Muslim, Muslim up in here, Muslim. It's an international city. It belongs to these four people. <laughs> it belongs to God. He said, it's my land. They said, Abraham, Abraham, I'm going give to you, give you a piece of land, and I swear by myself you're going to get it no matter what happens. I sure wouldn't want to be in the U.N. In downtown New York trying to steal somebody's land. Boy, if it was God's land, count me out. Oh, now there's the beginning and there's the end sitting up there. Now, you know how history ends, if you know anything about the Bible, Battle of Armageddon. You're familiar with that. So let's see how it's going to end. It's going to end right here. Where's Armageddon? Armageddon means the hill of the crowded. Right up here, this is the Valley of Armageddon, comes right down through here. The Kaishan River comes right down through here. Judges 5, 
That's where Saul got killed on Mount Gilboa, right there. That's where Gideon drove out the Midianites, right there. That's a, that's a valley that comes right down here, and the Armageddon is right there, and it's the hill of the crowd, so it's high ground in here, and high ground in here, and the valley comes down through here like this. And you're told in Revelation chapter 16, he gathered them together in a place called Armageddon. So you know how it's going to end, see. Uh, get your Bible there, and let's turn to Revelation 16, 16. Now here's how it's going to, here's where it's going to end. And he tells you where it's going to end. That's going to end with the Lord coming back, and you know these passages, read your Bible at all. Revelation 16, Revelation 16, 16. Uh, and he gathered them together in a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. What happens there? Let's turn to Revelation 19, verse 19. Now you're going to have to turn some pages tonight. Revelation 19. If you don't know where the books are, you're going to get a little exercise. Revelation 19, 19. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together against who? Jesus Christ. Look at verse 16. It ain't Russia against Germany or China against America. That's just piddling around. In this last one, the UN gets together against God and fights him. And he fights them. Let's see how the battle comes out. Joel chapter 3. When you find Joel, raise your hand. Joel chapter 3. Now the stuff I'm giving you, there's more in the Bible about this than there is in salvation. And modern Christian, that kind of upsets him. Your fellow talk that way, but that's the way it is. And you, what a modern Christian doesn't realize is two thirds of the Bible. How many got Joel? Raise your hand. Oh, I just well about three quarters of you. All right. What you don't realize? See this book right here. That much of that book is New Testament. That's Old Testament. And what the Christian, the dumb Christians have done over America, they're kind of like the Catholics. They've pretended God's all through with the Jew so you can jump the Old Testament. And you can't. More than three quarters of that Bible is Old Testament. And what, what does it deal with? It deals with a piece of dirt. That's the strangest thing. Joel chapter 3, verse 11. Assemble yourselves and come together, all ye heathen. Assemble. Gather yourselves together round about. Thither come, cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened. Come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Verse 13, put on the sickle for the harvest is ripe. 14, multitude, multitude in the valley of decision. 15, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord shall roar out of Zion and order his voice from where? Well, when did that happen? He's coming back to Jerusalem, Mount of Olives. So it's a roar like a lion. And the heaven and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel, and I don't mean the church. I don't mean you, nobody here. Those chosen people in that pasture are Jews, and they're in Israel at Jerusalem. And that's the second advent. More, take another passage, Isaiah, Isaiah 2, that's a good one. You know why that's a good one? That's in downtown New York. The idea of them birds stealing a quotation out of my King James Bible and putting it in downtown New York to make people think peace was going to come through the United Nations, a dirty bunch of hypocrites. I believe the book. What are they doing taking my Bible and messing up like that? Isaiah chapter 2. Up in downtown New York, you find a big wall across from the UN building. It's about the size of that back, just about the size of that back wall there. And it's got an inscription on it. You know what it says in that wall? Isaiah 2, it says this. It says, verse 4, after taking out 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 words. <laughs> Fine bunch of folks. Nothing but the best in the world. You land of the free and the home of the brave. Took God's verse and just knocked a quarter of it out because you didn't like it. And they printed this. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, that neither shall they learn war anymore. That's across from the UN building in downtown New York. No one of them 
planes hit New York. They just got the wrong building. They should, they should have hit the UN building. Yeah. You know what that is? That's 188 nations gathering down there to tell you they're going to bring peace in this earth and stop war. Biggest bunch of liars that ever walked on two feet. They're not going to stop war. You know how many wars have been since the UN took it, came in? I wrote them down. 89 of them. I got out of the service after World War II, and after World War II, those birds sponsored 89 wars. And I had the nerve to take a thing by King James Bible and put it down there about them bringing in peace. I, I posed for a picture. I went out and stood that wall and gave them this, you know, like that. <laughs> Let them think about that a while. You know what the Germans say? They say in case of rain, the war will be held in the auditorium. <laughs> All right, now look at this context, folks. Verse 2. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations, all nations, all nations, UN, all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of who? Jacob. Not Muhammad. And not the Pope. The God of Jacob. What's Jacob? He's a Jew. Not the God of not the God of the Pope, not a make believe God, the God of Jacob. And we will walk in this path, for out of Zion shall go forth the gospel. Did I read it right? No, I lied just like the UN. There's no gospel to it. The law, buddy. Come back when the Jews come back, in the millennium. Ezekiel forty, verse forty eight, and there's a scholar in America that believes that. They think the gospel did away with the law permanently. It didn't. That Jew comes back, they got a temple and they got sacrifices. Mm, 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 mm. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. See that thing right there? Now you see that beating them um, spears and them swords and the plowshares and pruning hooks? Go back to Joel chapter, Joel chapter 3 and look what we, I did just skip, just to give you a blessing. And... Just so you can get a broad viewpoint, go back to Joel and see what he said about those spears and those swords. Joel chapter 3, verse 9. Joel 3, verse 9. Proclaim this among the Gentiles. Okay, I will, Lord. Prepare war. <laughs> Good. In case of rain, the war will be held in the auditorium. <laughs> Prepare war. Wake up the mighty man. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords. And your pruning hooks and the spears, you're going to fight. They got the wrong quotation. The U.N. sat down, stole Isaiah 2, aborted it, stuck it up there, and then just walked around like they were respectable. And expect me to just say, oh, isn't that nice? You know. <laughs> All right, uh, Ze uh, Ze Zephaniah, chapter 3, verse 8. When you find Zephaniah, raise your hand. Zephaniah. I bet some of you it's been years since you looked at Zephaniah. Chapter 3, verse 8. Couple down here. Got this boy. Got it. Zephaniah 3. Some of you having a hard time there. Too much Reader's Digest. <laughs> Too much boob tube. Too much I Love Lucy, you know. All right, Zephaniah 3, verse 8. Now, this is God speaking. Don't take anything God says lightly. He's telling you in the, he's talking in the first person. Of course, you don't have to believe it. Might be a lie. Well, it is or isn't. Zephaniah 3.8. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, till the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to do what? United there you go. United Nations, the Lord put them together. He gathered them. And Zephaniah has written, what's the date? Give me a school for your reference date in the margin there. 630. What is it? 630. 630 years before Christ was born, the Lord set up the U.M. What are you going to do with that? I'm not talking about your religion. I never mentioned religion. I talked about something that took place in history. And 630 years before Christ was born, this guy, Zephaniah, wrote the thing down. But I'm not through yet that I may assemble the kingdoms. You know what they're called? They're called the United Nations Assembly. Now, how do you get that 630 years before Christ? 
It's right there. Now, what's this for? Why, it's to bring peace to earth, isn't it? Well, sure it is. Don't you know it is? <laughs> to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth, all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. You know what he says in the book of Matthew about that wheat and tares, for the harvest comes, gather the tares together in bundles and bind them. Get them in one bundle so I can burn them all in one shot. God's plan for the UN is to burn them. That is what's known as the power of negative thinking. And ever since Genesis chapter 12, God is looking for an alibi to wipe out all the nations, and now he's got one. He wouldn't do anything unjustly. He wouldn't wipe out two or three billion people unless he had a reason for doing it. So he's got him a reason now. He maneuvered him into position through history. And nobody even noticed it. Now they're caught. What are they caught? They're caught trying to take a piece of land that belongs to God. That doesn't have the right to defend his land? Well, he will. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 14. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments, not yet. He hath cast out thine enemy. Are you kidding? He's right there. The king of Israel, if the Lord is in the midst of thee. Well, that hasn't happened yet. That's history. He says the king of Israel is in Jerusalem. He is not in Jerusalem. Then he's either coming or it's a lie. Amen? amen. Come on, amen. I get on the fence or get off the fence. I mean, the book means what it says or it don't. Take it or throw it out. Verse 17, in case you missed it the first time. The Lord thy God is in the midst of thee. The middle of Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, that's the city that killed him. Old Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that, you know, murdered the prophets. They took, kicked him outside the gate. They, ki they killed him outside Jerusalem. They crucified him out here. And he says, I'm in the middle of you, and I'm here to save you. It didn't take place. Throw the book out. Unless it's going to take place. Now, that's where we're going, and we're going to be there a good while. All right, let's get to Micah, Micah chapter 5, verse 15. Micah chapter 5, verse 15, back to your left. Micah chapter 5, over to your right. Micah chapter 15, the short book. Uh, Micah up, up back there toward uh, Joel where you were. We'll get Micah chapter 5, and we'll get Micah 5, verse 15. Micah 5, 15. I will execute vengeance in anger and fury upon the heathen, such as not they've not heard. Vengeance against the heathen, not the not the Jew. Where's the Jew? Verse eight: The remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles like a lion, the beast of the forest. Seven: The remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people. Chapter four. Chapter four. Here are the nations. Chapter four, verse eleven: Now also many nations are gathered against thee. How about that? Many nations gather together against Jerusalem and say, Let her be defiled, that our eyes look upon Zion, but they know not the thoughts of the Lord. Amen. I do. You say, Why? Because I got them written right here. Amen. And he told me what they were. You say, Where? Just keep reading. Neither understand they his counsel. For he shall gather them as the sheaves into the floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, I'll get make thy hoofs brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people. And I will consecrate their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. This Armageddon, the second coming of Christ. Isaiah 34, verse 1 and 2. Isaiah 34, 1 and 2. How, how long does this theme run in the Bible? Over and over and over and over and over and over. It runs there so much when you get reading the Old Testament, you get tired of reading it. You go through there and it's because it's in the past, you just go through it and go through it and look at it. It's future. Isaiah 34, verse 1. Come near, ye nations. You see how much you hear is addressed to the UN? Well, there's more addressed to the UN than addressed to you. Come near, ye nations. 
to hear. Hearken ye people, let the earth hear. There's all 188 of them. It's addressed to the earth. It isn't addressed to the church. And all that is therein, the world, and all things that come forth of it. This is addressed to everything on the ground. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations. God bless America, a land that I love. You got the wrong song. You better try something else. The indignation of the Lord is against all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. That's the works. He hath utterly destroyed them. Hadn't happened yet. He hath delivered up to the slaughter. Hadn't happened yet. Their slain shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. Hadn't happened yet. When does it happen? I know when it happens. Verse 8. King James Bible. No Greek, no Hebrew, no commentaries. Can you read third grade English? Here she comes. <laughs> Verse 8, it is the day of the Lord's vengeance. What you get mad about, Lord, is the day of recompense for the controversy of Zion. That's what God's got against them. So that's my land, that's my people, that's my city, and that's the place for my king, and you stole it from me, and I'm going to get you. Amen. And brother, when God says he's going to get you, he's going to get you. Psalm 2. We'll only take 100 verses. There are about 500. That's the theme of this book. The theme of this book is a king and a kingdom. And the king is a Judean Jew, and the kingdom is Israel's. It's not the church's. Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers to take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. Christ, Christos, the Lord is his Savior. For he that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have him in derision. The UN meets tonight and they say, what do we do? What do we do? Let's stop terrorism. Let's all get together. Make the world safe for democracy. Let's get in here and let's put, let the Catholics be in there and their holy city and Muhammad's holy city and the Jews' holy city. And let's divide, they put a Palestinian state and, a, and the Lord's up there. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's going on. <laughs> it says derision. Do you know what derisive laughter is? It's ah, <laughs> that kind of thing, see? And the, that's the Lord. Now, ain't that a sweet Savior? Jesus loved the little children, all the children of the world. We come tonight to share God's love with you. If not the sweet spirit of Christ in this place, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. What's it to you? You know. <laughs> I mean, you got a you got a whole nation of people that are sick on sex and love. And you've forgotten God is not only love, our God is a what? Say it again. Say it again. You believe that? When you gotta have something to burn. He's going to burn him. He's going to burn him. He's going to burn him. Burn, baby, burn. <laughs> Verse 6. Yet I have set my king. No pope, no UN. God says, I got the king. I'll set my king upon my holy hill. What is that? That's the mosque on the dome. The, the dome oh, that's the mosque of Omar on the dome of the rock. That's where the temple was. And God says, that's my hill, and I'm putting my king on there. Amen. And he went and says, no, you're not. That's just a Christian belief. That's in that old book. Uh-huh. You'll find out what kind of book this is. Yes, you will. Amen. Christ says, don't curse by Jerusalem because it's the city of the great king. Who could that be? Guess who? You don't have to guess. Look at the next verse. I will declare the decree. Thou art my son. This day have I begotten me. Who could that be? <laughs> Folks, you don't have to have a fifth grade education to get this book. Just believe what you read. I will declare the decree. Thou art my son. It's Christ. Christ is the king. What does he get? 
He gets the throne of David at Jerusalem. Oh, well, I'm not spiritualized. It is, isn't it? Turn to Jeremiah. Come across the right, pick up Jeremiah. And give me Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 17. Jeremiah 3, 17. Now, we'll get into the charts in a minute. This is the introduction, you know, the message here coming. <laughs> I, I try to start someplace you're familiar with, and you're familiar with the end of the church age. That's the second coming of Christ in Armageddon. But boy, oh boy, what well, don't proceed that. Jeremiah 3.17. I hope you have a Bible. I hope you're reading. It won't do you any good to say, Ruckman said, Ruckman said, Ruckman said. You've got to know, what did God say? All right. Uh, say, what do you think, Brother Ruckman? What I think is immaterial. What you think is immaterial. You so said, you know, you should respect people's opinion. Not necessarily, no. <laughs> uh, you can tolerate them. You don't have to. you you got an age of people that got this funny idea that they have to be accepted. And you have to love all of them. No, you don't. You don't have to even like them. But in the Constitution, you have to tolerate them. See? 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 You've got to get the difference. I want to be accepted. You know, why do you want to be accepted? I don't want to be accepted. You don't like me? Same to you. See you later. <laughs> And folks say, what makes you like that? I'm an American. I don't think I should be forced to like anybody. I don't think you should be forced to like me. I don't believe in forcing people to like or dislike. That's your business. You folks, I hear these queers saying, well, I just, I just never felt accepted. I want the straight people to accept me. Why? Why? I don't want the queers to accept me. <laughs> what's, what's, well, there must be some difference between me and them something, you know. I mean, I don't have a, I don't have a homophobia. I've got a homo nausea, yeah. and I, I can't help it. I was just, I was just born that way, you know. I mean, I, yeah, I was 15 years old before I realized what I was, and then I got to 15, I realized I was normal, and it was such a shock. But I just can't help it. My genes and chromosomes, I'm just normal. <laughs> yeah, ma'am. All right, Jeremiah 3 verse 17. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of who? Lord. Well, when that happened, the idea of the Catholic Church saying he sat down after he wrote, came to the dead, sat down to heaven, he's reigning right now and reigning in the kingdom. The idea of some of you dumb Southern Baptists, and I said of a charity, of course, because I'm an ordained Southern Baptist minister. <laughs> I mean, I was ordained the largest church in the association, and my pastor was moderator of the association. I'm a Southern Baptist, so was Lester Olaf. So was Hugh Pyle, so was May Jackson, so was Lee Robertson, so was John R. Rice. They just didn't like us. <laughs> they got rid of us. <laughs> but you take, uh, you take a state, I don't believe Christ may rose from the dead, sat down on the throne and began his reign. I don't believe him coming down there and say, bless this offering, Lord, for the ongoing of thy kingdom. His kingdom ain't going nowhere. It's never been here. The kingdom don't show up till the king shows up. Now, come on, you folks that have some sense left. Do you, tell, you mean to tell me if Christ is reigning on the throne now that the last 2,000 years of history has been his work? <laughs> Impeach him! <laughs> Boy, if you think when Christ comes back you want to set up a kingdom like the one that's been here 2,000 years, you don't even know the Lord. I mean, first time they came, they spit on him and put the crown of thorns on him. You think that's going to happen next time he comes? <laughs> Listen, next time he comes, you fella, call, the next time, he, I don't have to worry about you, the people that are there. See, you'll be like Christ when he comes. So I don't worry, worry about you. But the people there, if they call a fella fool, they'll be in danger of hellfire. Ah, oh, there's where that Sermon on the Mount came from. When he comes, if a fella's right hand defend him, he'd better cut it off rather than go, there's where that thing came from. But I got nothing to do with you. They call your brother a fool. Oh, you fool, you fool, you, you stupid fool. <laughs> I ain't worried about that thing. You say, why not Paul call them fools? He said, oh, fools and slow. Christ said, oh, fools and slow of heart. Paul said, thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quick and except to die. And the body that you sow is not the body that shall be, but bare grain. So you've got to get your Bible right. All right, now, Christ's not up there reigning right now. He's up there as the head of the body. You're the body. You're part of the body. He's up there. He's your head. He's your master. Uh, you should be in subjection to Christ as a woman should be in subjection to her husband. But that isn't the subjection. A woman's subjection to her husband is, is not the subjection of a bond slave to a king. See? See? I mean, some of you guys need to get that, too. <laughs> All right, Jeremiah. Say, 
old Ruckman, you know, he's so macho, you know, and so, you know, chauvinistic, you know, and a woman hated and all this kind of stuff. Uh, why don't you, some of you folks, talk to my wife for a while? Yeah, 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 amen. And see if she's getting mistreated. Amen. I bet she gets treated a lot better than some of you guys treat your wife. Amen. You take your wife on the honeymoon every year overseas? Well, I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> you say, without the family? Yeah, just the two of us. Amen. We go to the Philippines one year, and India the next year, and Mexico the next year, and go to Korea the next year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She gets a servant girl to work for her two days a week. You get that? <laughs> yeah, Ruckman, Ruckman, yeah, Ruckman, your foot. Uh, Jeremiah 3, verse 17. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. And all the nations, you and New York, shall be gathered together to it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Not Rome. Rome's out. Just a hog sty. To Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more than after the imagination of their evil heart. Zechariah. Turn to Zechariah. It just goes on and on and on. Well, there aren't this many references on how to get saved in the New Testament. Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. Zechariah 14, verse 9. You got it, Chet? Next to the last book in your Old Testament. Right for Malachi. Zechariah 14, 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Oh, whoops. Not just king of Jacob. That time, king over all the earth. Christ said, when the king comes in his glory, he'll sit upon the throne of his glory in the city of the great king. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day, there shall be one Lord and his name one. There's him, and that's him in Jerusalem. He's right there. Let's try, um, oh, let's see, uh, Psalm uh, 95 or 97, that's Psalm 97, verse 1 and verse 5, Psalm 97, verse, you see this is what the UN is getting into, and none of them are looking at their Bibles, and the ones that are looking at it don't believe it, but this is what they're getting into, they're going right into three quarters of the Bible, and thumbing their nose at God and saying, we're going to run it, and you ain't going to run it. Psalm 97, verse, uh, what did I say? Psalm what? 90, 97, verse 1 and verse 5. And, uh, Psalm 97, 1. The Lord reigneth, not yet. Let the earth rejoice, not yet. You think your earth is rejoicing tonight? Watch the 10 o'clock newscast. <laughs> verse 5. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. First coming, no way, man. Look at verse 8. At this coming, Zion heard, and Judah rejoiced. For well, the first time he came, they nailed him to a cross. Not that time there. All right, now I'm going to take one more verse, and then we'll start on our chart. Come to Romans. Now, what are you going to do about that Jew? The Lord said about that Jew, he'd be dispersed. He'd wander among the nations. He'd be many days without an ephah, without image, without teraphim, without God, without king. What Paul said about that Jew, he said, those Jews have killed Jesus Christ and please not, and murdered their own prophets. They please not God, and the wrath of God has come upon them to the uttermost. The, an individual Jew today goes to hell when he dies, just like an individual Gentile. That the chosen people of God as a nation, but as individuals, they have to be saved just like you do. And Paul said, the wrath of God has come upon them to the uttermost. Look at here. Christ warned them of it. In Matthew chapter 8, after the Sermon on the Mount, when he comes down and gets talking to people, he says to a centurion, go to your, uh, I'll come here, your son. The centurion says, uh, don't come to me. I'm not worthy of you coming to my house. Just say the word. My, son, my, my, my boy will be all right. And, he, and, and Christ said, well, how do you figure that? And he said, well, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an officer too. I got men under me in the service. If I tell this fellow to do that, he does it. If I tell this fellow to do this, he does it. So I know if you tell the devil to get out of that boy and tell him to get healed, I know it will take place. And Christ turned to those Jews and said, and marveled, 
Verily I found not found such faith in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east, China, Japan, India, from the west, Europe and, Af and Africa and the United States, and from the north, Russia and Sweden and Denmark, from the south, Africa, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God, and the children of the kingdom be cast out of darkness, there shall be we we made an ash to Chosen people going to hell. How boot that. Now, uh, do you know what that rich man in hell said? Father Abraham. You know what he said? Son. See that thing? That ain't you. You got to get your Bible right. That's an unsaved Jew. You're, if you're unsaved, you're not God's son. But Israel was called God's son. Out of Egypt I have called my son. Israel is my firstborn. And I say to thee, let my firstborn go. But that's a nation. You're individual. That's something else. All right, Romans 11. Now, I never joined the Ku Klux Klan. And the only reason I haven't is because they're anti-Semitic. <laughs> and anti-Semitic means you're anti-Jew. And I can't afford to get connected with an outfit that's anti-Jew. There's an old saying, uh, the, ca the, the, the Jews own America and the Catholics run it, the niggers enjoy it. <laughs> How many ever heard that saying? Let me see your hands. Oh, well, you church folks got a lot to learn, don't you? <laughs> and a lot of truth in that, too. A lot of truth in that. You say, what if I'm a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant? You ain't got nothing. You don't have any rights, man. <laughs> You're out. <laughs> But you take this thing right here that about this Jew, this Jew as a, as a nation now is out of fellowship with God and the individuals that die without Christ go to hell. But they're still God's people as a nation. And we're dealing with the United Nations. And he says in Numbers chapter 23, Israel will not be numbered among the nations. Uh -uh. You know what that means? That means they've got to kick them out. The whole world has to turn against that Jew before it's through. And that's us. I say us, the United States with it. Now, you're a Christian. I'll show you how to handle a Jew. Romans 11, verse 25. I would not, brethren, brethren, see the saved people, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. God knows the press is. Lest you should be wise in your own conceit, like the Pope, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until... The fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. When? When there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and turn away on Godless and Jacob. They're going to all get converted to Christ. When he comes back, who's going to convert them? Moses and Elijah. Revelation chapter 11. 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Revelation chapter 7. You say, who knows about that in the U.N.? Nobody. Who knows about that in Congress? Nobody. Who knows about that in the Internet and the web? <laughs> Nobody, unless they're saved by a believing Christian. All right, now here's our deal. Verse 27. This is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. They're not taken away till he comes back. As concerning the gospel, okay, this, that's us. We believe the gospel. As concerning the gospel, what is it due to me? He's my enemy. He's my enemy. You try to get prayer out of the school, ACLU. Anti-defamation. You try to get Bible out of the school. See? Try to get the Christmas signs down. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies. See it? For your sake. I understand that perfectly. I understand that perfectly. But, look out for that disjunctive conjunction. But, as constructing the election. The fact that God chose them, they are beloved for the Father's sake. So you have to love them. Old, uh, what's his name, the sang with Billy Graham, George Beverly Shea, used to sing a song called Beloved Enemy. Well, what about the Jews that it should have been? Because that's what he's talking about. You have to love them. You don't have to like them. But you have to love them. And you have to pray for them. If you went to my church, you'd find a big blue strip. A uh, piece of graffiti up there on the wall going to my office and it says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. 
You say, why? Because when peace comes, that's where it's going to come at. They shall prosper. You want to prosper? They shall prosper that love thee. Love who? Jerusalem. He said, no religion to it. He didn't say they shall prosper that love the Lord. They shall prosper that love a piece of dirt. <laughs> Jerusalem. The history book. I'm telling you, the history book. All right, so there's your enemies, but you've got to love them. And they're very unlovable. Uh, no, 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 no rich American of Wall Street or Rothschild, they don't like Jews. Because Jews can make money, and Gentiles love money. <laughs> I mean, oh, then in Russia one time, a Gentile said to a Jew, he said, we don't have any Jews in our village. And the Jew said, that's why it's still a village. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've got to love that Jew. And I, I'll tell you about this. I've told you about this before. But uh, I don't, there's something about Jews just, it's irritating. I don't know what it is. Uh, they call it chutzpah, the, the Jews call it. And there's kind of an arrogancy, kind of a, kind of a, I'm here, look who I, you know, it's just, it's just irritating thing. Even the same ones. So those guys like, that guy bought the uh, uh, pre-wrath tr- uh, rapture. So yeah, they irritate about those guys. I think they're so smart. Some of them are half smart. But you take, I had a blind Jewish evangelist come to my house one time. His name was Marx. He had a CNI dog. He was a, he's a good fellow. He saved, loved the Lord, believed the book. But in the most irritating way, I mean, he'd come and say, well, I'm here. Do they know I'm here? You know my people? I said, yeah, I know you're here. Did you tell the newspapers about me? They know who I am. I think, yeah, I guess they know about you. <laughs> he kept with that stuff. I got more irritated. I shouldn't have got irritated, but I did. And you know, blind people, their hearing is usually much more acute than yours is. <laughs> and <laughs> I've got my house. I have more German marshes than any German general has got in Germany, probably. I mean, 40 hours of it. And I, I got me one of those records. It's a, it's a, it's a thing that's called Parada March to Langen Carol. So that means the parade of the tall fellows. And that's a six-foot division that, that Rommel had, a, a panzer division. And the, the, the guide on, the short man in that division was six feet tall. The rest of them were six one, six two, six three, six four, six five, six six. And this is a white glove parade with jack boots. And it's a slow goose step. They have 120 minutes like ours, but they have a slow one that goes about 100 a minute. And they do that because when the guy comes like this, he comes straight up like this. When he, when he, he just, it isn't just a mark like this. That's 120. But the slow one, they go like this, like this, like that. And I got a record of that thing. You hear these jackboots coming down the street? And I played that for that Jew. <laughs> and they go, they go, oh, dum, da, dum. And those boots going, clack, 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 clack. And I'm telling that juice out there, and the sweat just rolled off his face, boy, <laughs> ran down to of his neck. He just got sopping wet, man. And I sat there, I just felt like a dog, man. I felt like a dog. I, said, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that, you know. And he got all through, and he said, Where did you get that from? <laughs> You know what I did to atone my sins? I let him sleep in my bed that night. <laughs> I, I really did. I was to God, man, when I slept down the porch, I let him sleep on my bed, see? I'm supposed to love him, see? I pray for the priests of Jerusalem. Why? Well, you idiot, because no peace can come till it comes there. You know what Jerusalem means? Can't you guess? S-A-L-E-M on the end of it. Salem. Shalom. Shalom Aleichem. Peace be unto thee. The word means city of peace. City of peace. <laughs> it's been attacked 27 times. But when peace comes, it comes to Jerusalem. You're wasting your time in New York. Beijing and Rome and Moscow. That's news media crap. That's got to with the Bible. When peace comes, it comes to the city of peace. Melchizedek, king of Salem, which is by interpretation, king of righteousness, and after that, King of Peace. I got to get a couple more here. Hey, guy, on this peace thing, and then I'll get on this thing. I got to get on it sometime. Hey, guy, when you find Hey, guy, raise your hand. You went right by him a couple times in Misty when you were going through Zachariah and Joel. <laughs> okay, right, raise your hand. Not a half of you yet. Hey, guy. Hey, guy. 
Hey guy, who that? <laughs> who that say who that? I say who that? Hey guy, chapter two. Now, one time many years ago, a great German composer, Johann Sebastian Bach, wrote a tune called "Jesus, Joy of Man Desiring." That's a great song. It's a great song. But Bach was post millennial like Handel, like most of your Christmas hymns are, and it's a, too bad those fellows didn't have the light we had. But most of those Christmas hymns you have are Christ reigning now. Yeah. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. No. Receive a savior. Right. Let heaven and nature sing. Nature is under a curse and it ain't singing nothing. Right. See, I mean, the beautiful hymns, we sing them every Christmas time. But boy, the theology is terrible, man. It's terrible. <laughs> All right, now here's Haggai. Now here's where Bach got his stuff from. Uh, verse uh, 7, I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. The desire, meaning Christ, shall come. There's no word truth in that. Christ has never been the desire of all nations. Don't you know that? You people here, do you think this nation really desires Jesus Christ to come back? Well, why don't you go out and talk to them and see if they do? <laughs> this, this nation doesn't want Christ to come back. Christ not the desire of all nations. Look here, I'll, I'll shake all nations. That didn't happen when Christ came back. No nation got shook. Why not even Israel got shook for 40 years after he was dead? That's the second coming. Verse 9, the glory of this latter house, the temple, will be greater than the former house, the temple. And in this place will I give peace, and that is the desire of all nations. Peace. That's why they talk about it day and night and night and day and day and night and night and day. Peace process, peacekeeping forces, peace, peace, peace to on earth, goodwill to man, peace. That's the desire of all nations, peace. And God told you where he'd give it to you. Folks, I'm telling you, you don't have to have a fifth grade education. You just learn to read fairly well. I mean, past the fourth grade. Only one of my, I had a guy come out school one time. I get, I've got a, I've got quite a school, you probably imagine, you know. I mean, I don't pastor a church. I, I pastor a zoo. <laughs> and I mean, I've gotten the guys in there, black belts and karate and taekwondo and former jailbirds and guys done time and guys coming off pot still getting flashbacks. I mean, I've got a bunch of fellows there from every part of the earth you could think of in there. All kinds in there. And I, I got one fellow there and he flunked the second grade twice and flunked the fifth grade coming up. And that fellow was, when he came to school, he'd write Bible, B-I-B-U-L, when he was, you know, when he was uh, 30 years old, his name was Nathan Bemis. And any of them know Nathan Bemis? A couple of them. That's one of the sweetest souls you ever see in your life. And that fellow's filled with the spirit, boy. That sucker went up to Montana and began in a Quonset hut in 30 below zero with 15 people. And he'd been running 200 in Sunday school and has preached everybody within 100 miles of him. He loves the Lord and reads the book, but he's just a dummy. You know, he's just slow. <laughs> and he'd read his Bible. And so he came to the front and they went about 20 feet to the front of them. And as they entered into the front <laughs> he, he couldn't pronounce the word. He just said, mm, go by. He flunked Greek twice. And he used to write his Greek vocabulary words down on a piece of uh, lumber to memorize them while he worked there at the place. And that fellow told me he, he flunked the second grade twice. Uh, that fellow so dumb he couldn't pass fire drill. <laughs> And, 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 and he, was the, he said he was the only guy driving a car to middle school when he got there. Because, because back in those days, back in those days, every time a guy flunked, you sent him back a whole grade, see? It didn't like it is now. I mean, you, you, you flunked one course, you went back a whole grade. And that, that, that beam was a character boy. But you ought to see his Bible. His Bible marked mark up mine. I don't have my marked up Bible here. This is just an uh, old Gideon Bible up. Pick up carry. It doesn't have any uh, margin in it, no notes in it. But I can't bring my reference Bibles with me. They've got too much in them. I count them up today, 73,000 notes. And there's so many notes in my there in three volumes. The first volume is Genesis to Chronicles. The next one is Chronicles to Malachi. The third one is Matthew with a blank page between each page. And all of them filled. But Bemis's thing is like that too. And then the hardly a page in his book that just isn't marked up with a colored pencil. Just marked and marked and marked. And that old boy, honest goodness, he knows more Bible 
He knows more Bible right now where he is than any faculty member of Tennessee Temple College. Amen. Any of them. When he got out there to Montana, he ran to a Ph.D. from uh, Louisville Seminary, and they were arguing about the Greek, and the fellow said, paying the Greek, saying the Greek, and he didn't know Bemis had studied Greek. And Bemis pulls in his pocket and pulls out the Greek New Testament, and says, uh, what does the critical apparatus say about that? And that guy looks at it, you know, like a calf looking at a new gate. <laughs> he doesn't he know what to do with it, you know. And he never learned how to read it. And for six weeks, he'd meet with Nathan Bemis, and Nathan Bemis would teach him how to read the critical apparatus in the bottom of a Nestle's Greek New Testament. That's the old boy flunked the fifth grade. Uh, brethren, don't worry about your brains. Worry about your time. Spend some time in the book. Uh, when peace comes, it comes to Jerusalem, the city of peace, when it comes. Okay, now we're ready. Uh, here we have this piece of land. The one, the one we're going to get into is right here. All right, what happened? Well, the Jews were in the land under David and Solomon. Their kingdom looked like this, under David and Solomon. Palestinian has never been a Palestinian state. Pal the only people that ever set up a state government in Palestine were the Jews. The Romans didn't set up one when they were there. The Turks didn't set up one when they were there. And the Catholics set up the kingdom of Jerusalem after the Crusades. It only lasted about three years. After that, the Turks took it over. And in World War I, the British took it from the Turks. Palestinians never had it. There's no such thing as a Palestinian. Amen. But people lived in Palestine throughout these ages. There were Germans living there. There were Frenchmen living there. Englishmen, Greeks, Moroccans, Libyans, Egyptians, all kinds of people. It never was a state or a culture. But Brother Rupp read in the paper, the paper will get you killed Amen. because those crazy nuts don't know what they're talking about about half the time. Amen. Now, they're not, they not going to know nothing about what I'm going to show you here tonight. Any of them. You said they've been to college. That's, how they, that's where they lost their brains in college. <laughs> if they spend as much time in the book as they spend in college, they know something. Oh, and here David and Solomon. See these kingdoms? When they came in there, all this was the state, and then it went curt there to Euphrates. How do you know that? Turn to 1 Kings 4. Get 1 Kings 4 in one hand and get 2 Samuel 8 in the other. And notice in those passages right there that that kingdom went through up like that to there. So the kingdom of Israel began there and went clean down through there. Uh, Second Kings uh, chapter 4, I want a verse there that says, There were many by the sand of the sea, even drinking. There was peace in the days of Solomon from the river to the, where, what is it? 20. 20, all right, 420. First Kings 420, see that? First Kings 420. To the Euphrates. He got the piece of land that God promised to give to Abraham. All right, now take 2 Samuel, look at it again. 2 Samuel chapter uh, 8, and I think it's about verse 3 or 4. I want a verse says, He went to the Euphrates to recover his border. 3. 2 uh, Samuel chapter 8, verse 3. He went uh, to recover his border at the river Euphrates. Yeah. Is that thing right there? Which means that kingdom goes up to here. That includes the Golan Heights. That includes Lebanon. Amen. That includes Damascus. Amen. That includes Bayreuth. Amen. So when you read your paper about Syrians in Bayreuth bragging about having missiles they shoot down in Israel and the Golan Heights belonging to the Syrians so they can send them to suicide bombers, you're reading about your people have stolen a piece of land that isn't theirs. That's right. That's right. And it don't just belong to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If the account's right, it belongs to God. Amen. Mm better keep your hands off stuff that belongs to God. The tithe is the Lord's. <laughs> Be careful what you do with the tithe. <laughs> your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Be careful what you do with your body. You better not fool with the widows and orphans. The Lord says, I'm taking care of them. If it belongs to God, you better be careful. All right, now here's the, that, that, there's the kingdom. Now what happened? The Jews disobeyed God, and he warned them. He told them what would happen. He said, you going to be my people? Yes. You do what I tell you to do? Yes. I'm giving you the law. You're going to keep it? Yes, sir. All the words the Lord has spoken, we will do. The Lord said, okay. I'm going to make you my people, a chosen people, a peculiar people, Exodus chapter 20 and Exodus chapter 19, and you'll be a special people of all the people on the earth. And if you'll do, conditional. And if, and if, conditional, better watch your step. 
I promised Abraham wasn't conditional. This one is. All right, he says, if you live right, do right, do what I say, you can stay in the land. And if you don't, you'll get run out of the land. And the worst chapter in the Bible, the most horrible chapter in the Bible, the whole Bible, if I don't think about reading, is Deuteronomy 28. And that chapter has in it the most terrible verse I've ever read anywhere in the book. And it says to that Jew, if you don't do what I told you to do, I'm going to drive you out, and I'm going to do this to you, and that to you, and this to you, and that to you. And then down there he says, it came to pass, as I rejoiced over you to do you good, I will rejoice over you to destroy you. Now, if we don't get any more bloody than that, how about that? That's God's chosen people. And the Lord said, when that holocaust starts with Hitler, and they start picking those babies, and banging their head up against the wall, and taking those babies and ripping them apart in front of their mothers, and taking those women and skinning them alive, and hanging by a tree, and shooting off their wrists, and shooting off their ankles, and throwing them in the furnace, I'll rejoice. And I bet you half you people don't even believe that. And that's in that book you've been reading all night. Amen. Right in the book. Deuteronomy 28. I call it the power of negative thinking. Our God is love. Our God is consuming fire. What? Furnace. He says in Matthew 13, He'll cast them a furnace of fire. There shall be weeping and wailing and asking. In they go. History. I'm not talking about what you believe. I don't care what you believe. They went in. The furnace. They burned. He said they would. They did. See? That's the trouble with that book. If that book would just lay off telling the truth. But that book always tells the truth about what's going to happen, and the thing happens. All right, he says, if you don't, I'm going to take you away. So what happened? You know what happened. Solomon got in. Solomon, the son of David. The Lord gave him a... David, an unconditional covenant, I'll read you in a minute, and then gave him a conditional one, which I'll read you in a minute, and then gave him a conditional covenant in the land, and then gave him an unconditional covenant, I'll read that in a minute. But at any rate, he got in there, and Solomon messed up. What did Solomon do? Deuteronomy chapter 17 says, When you take a king, you've got to take a king over one of your brethren. You can't take a king over a foreign country. And when you take a king, number one, he can't multiply wives to himself. Deuteronomy 17. Did you ever read that? I'll bet some of you don't know where it is. He's not to multiply wives to himself. You know how that bird had? He had a thousand of them. He'll not return to Egypt to get horses. He had stables full of them. Twenty thousand. What's wrong with them Egyptian horses? Well, Leviticus 19 and 20, they've been messing with women. If you get those Syrian horses, you take them and ham cut the hamstrings. How them? H-O-U-G-H. You ever read that? Of course you do. Who reads the Old Testament? I know the I know the condition of Christians in America. The best of you. Not a lot of good folks here tonight. But you don't take that book seriously, or you don't like it, or don't want to read it. You know what that king did? Deuteronomy 17. He shall not multiply silver or gold to himself. That fellow made gold so abundant the Bible said the silver was like dust in the streets. He'll not marry strange wives. And Nehemiah 13, 26 says, Solomon was beloved of his God, yet even him did outlandish women, women outside the land, cause to sin. And it came to pass, when Solomon was old, his wives stole his heart, and he worshipped Chemish, the abomination of the Ammonites, and worshipped Molech, the abomination of the Philistines. Got the wrong king. Solomon died, the country went to pieces, and in one day, one day in comes from here, Assyria, Sennacherib. He comes in here, and he takes out ten northern tribes, and takes them to Golan, up there in the Assyria, beyond the river, the captivity. And then Judah goes in apostasy. That's Kings. Who reads Kings? Chronicles. Who reads Chronicles? Chronicles and Kings. About time it showed up. Got the battery here.
made, made in America for suckers, whatever it is. Everything in America is made what we call built-in obsolescence. Can you hear me now? <laughs> you faded shoot. Working now? Okay, go a little while. All right, in comes Assyria, king of Assyria, and takes this northern bunch away. Mm -hmm. In comes Nebuchadnezzar and takes away Judah and Benjamin. They go off to Babylon. When the Jews get taken to dispersions, Judah and Benjamin are over here, and the other ten tribes are up here. They're taken to captivity. And then they repent and they get right. And after 70 years, they come back. And they come back into the land. They come back in the land. Then Christ shows up. And when Christ shows up, they reject him. They reject him as a Savior. You know what they say? That before Pilate. And Pilate says, I crucify your king. And they say, we have no king but who? Caesar. Woo, you shouldn't have said that. Caesar's a Roman. And from that day to this, the Jew has been under the Roman Catholic Church. And the greatest leader they ever had was Adolf Hitler. Roman Catholic. You want a king from Rome? Buddy, you got him. All right, now, they get back from the captivity. Ezra and Nehemiah. They go into apostasy. Christ shows up. They reject him. His blood be upon us, upon our children. 70 A.D., in comes Titus, burns down Jerusalem, crucifies 500 Jews outside the city, and the times of the Gentiles begin. Now, I'll skip all that. I'll skip 1900 years. I'll come up into, say, I'll come up into, uh, let's come up into 1917. Here's this piece of land here. Here's this city in it. And the Turks own this. And in 1917, World War I, who reads about the World War I? In 1917, in December, in comes General Allenby, A-L-L-E-N-B-Y, an English general, and walks into Jerusalem with the British troops and takes it over. And the Muhammad stand around and watch the Arabs. And none of them object because Alan Bey means Allah Bey, prophet of Allah. How about that? Now, who set that one up? Right. Amen. I'm telling you, that book is a bomb, man. <laughs> and he comes in, the Turks run, and that thing becomes what we call a British mandate. Now, for 1917, you see what's in pink? That belongs to England, not as a state. Palestine has never been a state. When the Turks had it, it wasn't a state. It was just a military colony. When the British had it, it wasn't a, a Palestinian state. It was a British mandate. That's 1917. Or right, 1917, it sits up like this. 1917, some people you should know. Right, here's the first one. Chaim Weizmann. Chaim Weizmann is a Jew. Chaim Weizmann is a Jew during World War I, and he invents cordite and smokeless gunpowder and helps the British Navy win the war. And Churchill, who was president of the Admiralty at that time, decided to do Chaim Weizmann a favor for helping England out, and which they should. It's funny, but almost every time a Gentile gets into trouble, a Jew has to get him out of it. That atom bomb came a Jew. That's Einstein. That's a German Jew. This thing came from Weizmann. He's an Austrian Jew. He was born in Budapest and raised in Vienna. And Weizmann helps the English people out, and because of that, uh, Lord Balfour, that's a fellow in the English Parliament, like be like a senator over here, goes to Rothschild, a, Jew, a Jewish banker, and says, I think we should uh, give you people a, a, a favor because you've been a blessing to us, and this fellow Weizmann has been hollering for a Jewish homeland for about 20 years, what he calls Zionism, and what do you say we get up a thing here, a paper, that will give the Jews back Palestine as a homeland? 1917. That thing right there? That's the beginning of the end for the Gentiles. That marks God taking up his dealing with Israel again after 1900 years. In 1917, your stock starts going down. It goes down before I'm born. I'm born 1921. But that thing starts going down right there in 1917. And the Jews on the way up. All right, 1917, here's what they call the Balfour Declaration. 
The Balfour Declaration is one of the English lords in the House of Lords, Balf Lord Balfour, writing out a thing that says we should give the uh, Palestine the Jews as a homeland for the Jews and put them under a British mandate so they can get set up. A homeland, see, a state, a Jewish state. And boy, when that thing comes out in 1917, <laughs> up steps the poop. Never. They've got the blood of Christ in their hands. That land is sacred. That land is holy. You can't let that Christ rejecting Jew on there. The Jews are Christ killer. That'd be blasphemy. Somebody says, hey man, you had them Turks on there for 500 years. You never raised a squawk. How come you didn't drive them out? Oh, well, we did try in the crusade. Well, you must have the wrong God. You lost your britches. <laughs> I mean, Allah beat that one. And then, you know what the pa Papa did? God bless his heart. He reprinted hundreds and thousands of copies of a, a, little, a little book called the, uh, the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. And he ever seen a copy? Let's see your hands. Just a handful. Get that on the net. That's what Hitler got a hold of. It made him anti-Semitic. And the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion is a book about 50 pages that contains supposedly a Jewish plan to take over the Gentile nations. Call them Goyim. And uh, that thing there was circulated all over the British Army of Occupation here in 1917, all over there, those Jews, uh, of British soldiers in here. So they'd, uh, if the Jews came over, they wouldn't uh, care for them. And they wouldn't take care of them. And as it came out, they sided with the Arabs. And that's why the Jews began to have to kill some of the Englishmen with this bunch right here. England turned out to be as bad as enemy as the Arabs did. And that's when the sun done set on the British Empire. And down she went, never rose again. This way, Britannica rules the way. Ta -da, da 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 The sun never sets the British Empire. Brother, it done set. People, England today is a fifth-rate world power, or sixth. Russia's ahead of it, China's ahead of it, Japan is ahead of it, Germany's ahead of it, the United States is ahead of it, and there might be a couple more. But there was a day when England ran the thing, but something went wrong in 1921, because, boy, when that thing came out there, the Arabs began to raise Cain down in Egypt, to kill the Jews, kill the Jews, down with the Jews. You know, Muhammad, Allah Akbar, boy, here we go, boy. And old Winnie the Pooh Churchill was down in, in Morocco and Algiers talking with the Muhammad as he met with them in, uh, in, uh, in, in Egypt. And they had a conference there with banners outside, down with Israel there, uh, kill the Jews, uh, away with the Jews, you know, we want our liberties, we want our rights. And old Winnie the Pooh sat down in 1921 and he bragged about this. And said, with one stroke of a pen, I created Transjordan. What do you mean by that? He meant with one stroke of a pen, he divided Palestine right down through here and gave all that to Allah and Muhammad. But that's the Lord's land that he gave to the Jews. That's Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh on the east bank. Where do you get that from? Joshua. You ever read Joshua? Then Joshua, the Reuben, Gad, and half tribe Manasseh said, good cattle land over here. Let us build over here instead of the other side. And he said, you're going to get us in trouble turning your back? They said, okay, we'll do. We'll go over Jordan and fight for you. And after you win, we'll come back and inherit this place here. And they did. That's Israel. That's their land. And in 1921, Winston Churchill gave half that land away to uh, Muhammad and, and uh, Allah. This has been lying out there before. It's pretty long. You know, it isn't too tough. <laughs> and uh, so he gave that stuff all the way to Muhammad and Allah. And when he did that, you know what the Lord did? He said, they went over to Germany. He got a big old fat boy over there, about 50 pounds overweight. And he said, Herman, <laughs> I've got a job for you. He said, about, what's that? I said, I want you to bomb Coventry off the map. Just get a V-2 rocket and just blow them out. Befail is befail. Order is an order. We'll do it. You know, the next thing that happened after he signed that paper, up came Mahatma Gandhi and they lost India. You know what happened after that paper? 
found a melee in Singapore. They lost melee in Singapore. The Japs came in. They cleaned them out. And they lost Hong Kong. They lost British Guiana. And they lost their holding in South Africa. Rhodesia? That's the Rhodes Scholarship, man. That's Cecil Rhodes. That's an Englishman. It ain't Rhodesia anymore. It's Zimbabwe. Zambaba, Zambuba, Zambaba, Waba, Amuba, Gama, 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 You know. They lost the shirt. You say, why? The Lord said to Abraham, I'll bless those that bless thee and curse those that curse thee. And the Lord told Abraham, that land I'm giving to you with no conditions. Now, you see, there were conditions when the nation was there. So everybody said the nation disobeys and they go out and then they reject Christ. Now God's all through with them. Man, when God gave that thing to Abraham in Genesis 15, we read here about an hour ago, when he gave him that thing over there in Genesis 15, Abraham was not only asleep, Abraham wasn't a Jew. Abraham was a Gentile. He came from Shem. They're called Hebrews. They weren't Jews. They're no Jews. You start that circumcision stuff. That's Genesis 17. Uh oh, you missed a couple of chapters, buddy. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's the most deceptive, deadly thing you ever saw in your life. The right now, they don't know it, but in downtown New York, 188 nations, their destiny depends upon a man being asleep. Now, ain't that a wild one? He was asleep, so there were no conditions of the promise. And the United Nations is going with the thing that if the Jews disobeyed and got run out, God's all through with them, therefore the promise doesn't work. But there wasn't any condition. It was unconditional. All right, now this thing goes in 1921. Now in 1921, here come the Jews starting back, drifting back. And they start coming back, and right away the Arabs begin to raise Cain. And the terrorism starts, killing civilians. You know how long that Jew was put up with terrorism? Eighty years. And the first time you had a little old accident in New York. It didn't take a couple hours. Oh, my God! Where were you all this time here? Eighty years killing them. I got the clippings. I got a pile of them that big. Talk about killing eight and nine-year-old kids. Sure, eight-month and six-month-year-old kids. Bombing up women, bombing up men, bombing up civilians. Eighty years. And we don't squawk till now. What's the matter with us? Make the world a safer democracy and all that kind of jazz. All right, 21, that thing goes. Now, 1929, here's the Grand Mufti in Jerusalem in 1929. One day, 20,000 Muslims show up at the Mosque of Omar here on the hill. And the British mandate, the British colonel says, I say, oh boy, <laughs> I've noticed some of your... I was going to say, I was going to say, I was going to say raghead, but... I was going to say raghead, but I don't guess it's the right term to use. Uh, or camel jockey. At any rate, that Colonel K said, I say, old boy, he said, uh, I notice your prayer warriors are coming today uh, are carrying clubs under their robes. What's that for? And the Mufti, you know, Arafat, you know, yeah. that's his uncle, the Grand Mufti. Right. As well, uh, uh, that's just in case somebody might attack them while we're at prayer. Who ever heard of a Jew attacking the Muslim at prayer? What a thing to say. And boy, an hour later, out came the clubs, and there were swords there, as well as clubs, and there were guns, and they killed 100 Jews that day in 929. And the British didn't protect the Jews. And the Jews said, well, if England's going to help us, we've got to take care of ourselves. So they formed this group. This is called the Haganah. It's now called the IDF, Israel Defense Force. It was called the Haganah. And because the Haganah couldn't handle everything, they had another more loose gang like a SWAT team or FBI called Irgun. But this bunch here, they were radical, and they saw the trouble right away. And they said, the Englishmen are going to give you more trouble than Arabs. You better run out the Englishmen, too. So that's an outlaw gang called the Stern Gang. And they start killing Britishers and blowing up hotels to get, uh, uh, get protect their people. That stuff goes on from 1921 to 1929. And then what happens? Well, they have some good leaders here. Here's Ben-Gurion, Golda Meir, Moshe Dion. Those are good Jewish leaders. 
about the time the Balfour Declaration goes through, the, they vote for it and against it in the League of Nations. And Kaiser Wilhelm, he doesn't want anything to do with it. And, uh, he, Kaiser Wilhelm planned on entering Jerusalem on a white horse. And he was going to come through the Eastern Gate, which is about there, on a white horse, imitating Christ, Revelation 19. See, when Christ comes back, he lands the Mount of Olives, and then he goes across, he comes to the Mount of Olives, and he goes here, and he comes through the Eastern Gate in Jerusalem. But you can't get through the Eastern Gate. It's cemented shut. You know how long it's been cemented shut? Since the Crusades. Nobody can go through it. Of course, when the Lord comes back, he can get right through it. Because he went through a closed door when he went to the disciples in Luke 24. You're going to be, by the way, you're going to be behind the Lord. I, I, I'm, you're going to get in on this, see. <laughs> but you're behind the Lord. You're coming in, see. And then the Lord does a very terrible thing because when they put that thing up, the Mohammedans buried all their dead people in a graveyard on that side so nobody could walk over them. And the Lord comes back, he going to stomp right on them to get through the eastern gate. All right, all kind of things there, isn't there? All right, let's get along here. Here's 1929, now we'll skip a few years. 1939, here comes Adolf Hitler. Up shows Adolf Hitler, and the Jews say, we got to get out, we got to get out, where shall we go? And the nations met over there and had a big meeting over there, and Americans were there, and South Americans were there, and Spaniards were there, and Italians were there, and Frenchmen were there. And the question was, who would take the Jew? And the answer is, nobody wanted him. And the South American people said, send us some farmers, but don't send us any Jewish doctors and lawyers. And Russia said, we've got enough of them already, we, we, we don't want to take any more the other nation said, I'm sorry, our status is full. The Catholic countries like Brazil and Honduras and Central America said, no, sir, nothing doing. The United States says, we'll take uh, 7,000 a year, but no more than that. Six million of them are about to get killed. We'll take 7,000 a year. You think the Lord doesn't see all this stuff? I'll bless those that bless thee and curse those that curse thee. He said, you've got to love that Jew. All right, the time comes for them to go back. They try to go back, and when they get back over there, the Arabs say, no, sir, and boy, around 1930 and 35, right before World War II broke out, the, the Englishmen, the English, not the Germans, had the concentration camp set up on barbed wire on the beaches in Jaffa and Tel Aviv when the Jews came in and couldn't land. How many of you ever saw a picture called Exodus? Can I see your hand? Can you ever see that thing right there? That thing took place toward the end of the war, around 45 and 46. And nobody had taken them, and they sent someone back to Germany to get killed. Churchill offered just, uh, countries in Europe money to keep them from escaping out of Europe and getting into Palestine. And the Lord said, okay, buddy, you asked for it, you're going to get it. And England got it in the neck. You go over there, there are moths all over the place over there right now. While well, a British Bobby never carried a, he never carried a, a pistol on him till about 1990, but boy, by 1990, so many foreigners come in there that they started carrying pistols. Policemen in 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 in, uh, in England are noted for the fact they just carried a billy club with them. Not anymore. They carry guns, and they got gun law to keep you from carrying guns. They got a problem like we got now. By God, we're going to have some more problems if we don't get on the right side. All right, long term, 39, here comes Adolf. Kill the Jews, genocide, anti-Semitism. Kill the Jews, kill the Jews. The Jews are all the trouble. And about that time, up shows a fellow who will always be a dear friend of mine. I never met him, but I'd like to meet him. I hope he's in heaven. I don't remember that he ever got saved. I don't ever remember his testimony, but his name is Meinertz Hagen. He's a German, but born in England. You see, you have German Jews, Einstein, you have German Englishman, minor soccer, and you have Handel is a German Englishman. Handel is a German. He's an Englishman. Uh, you take uh, Rothschild. He's, a, he's an English Jew. And Minor Hagen is a colonel of the British intelligence. And boy, would I like to meet that guy. That's one of the greatest prophets that ever lived. He'd make Muhammad look like, uh, like uh, Madonna. <laughs> I mean, you take, you take Minor Hagen, he'll say, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. And every time he said it happens, it's going to happen. He said, this war here will never stop. It'll go on till the Jews are a state. 
he says, if the Jews get in there and them together, who's going to protect and the outline, the out, outline places to take care of security? He got the whole thing down. And Midas Sagan says, we have reneged on the Balfour Declaration. We've gone back on it. And the Jews said, yes, sir. That paper by Winston Churchill in 21 and 29 are called white papers. How many ever heard that expression? You'll see your hand. All right, that's called a white paper. And a white paper is a paper that denies the Balfour Declaration. And Churchill signed both of them. And 39, he signed another one that said only 15,000 Jews a year could go back to Palestine while Hitler was killing them. So he's a fine fellow. This minor Sagan knew Churchill. He knew Hitler. He knew King George. He knew Lord Balfour. He knew Rothschild. He knew the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. He knew Arafat. This fellow was British intelligence and had contact with everybody, including Lawrence of Arabia. Everybody in that day. He wrote a book called Middle East Diary, about that big, and I bet you probably can't even get it on your net. Because it's the most racist thing you've ever read in your life. Oh, Midas Sagan, he knew Arabs from living with them. And he knew Jews from living with them. And he knew Englishmen from living with them. And he don't tell you, he don't hesitate to tell you what's wrong. He'll tell you real quick. And Midas Sagan said, that Jew, when somebody asked him, they said, the way you talk for that Jew, you must be Jewish. He said, no, I'm not, I'm not Jewish. I wish I was. I'm not as smart as those people. <laughs> Character. Minor Sagan went and got a hold of, uh, of King George and said, you didn't treat the Jew right. You should, you, Israel has, a, a British, England has betrayed his trust. He said, we had a great opportunity to help that Jew, and you know that Jew is God's uh, uh, nation on earth, and you ought to help that Jew. And he got a lot of static for that. And long about, oh, about the time that war broke out, uh, here comes the Grand Mufti of uh, Arabia over there with some of his ragheads, and they come over to the parliament and bow down, you know, flies buzzing around their head, I guess. And they come in there and say, uh, you better be careful about that Jew, you know, we've got the oil. Yeah. Yeah. And parliament votes to renege on the Balfour Declaration. They didn't get to do it, but they voted on to do it. They, had, they wanted to do it. And about that time, an old Puritan in Parliament named Sir John Halsam got up, H-A-L-S-A-M. And he got up there in front of the House of Parliament, opened that Bible, Amos 9, and read the last two verses. He read those last two verses, and he said, Gentlemen, you know that those are God's chosen people, and you know God said, I'll bless those that bless thee and curse those that curse thee. He said, I hope you don't do this ridiculous thing. Stand by the book and stand by Israel. Walked off the platform. And they didn't. All right, the war broke out. The war broke out, and you know who won the war. And during the war, the Jew had to fight with the Englishmen, even though they were bitter enemies, had to fight with them. Because they could choose either to fight with him or fight with the Arabs who lined up with Germany. But the Grand Mufti did in World War II, he went to Berlin. And Hitler gave him a house in Goethe-Strasse, and he got down there and took care of him through the whole war, gave him a bloodproof vest, and then sent him back after the war. That's Arafat's uncle. Genocide. Kill them Jews. All right, it's come up in 1948. Boy, in 1948, the world's all stirred up now. Don't you think we better let those Jews go back? Look what they've been through. Now they've got world sympathy. Now they're going to make it. Well, not quite. And the U.N. gets to vote on it. They vote one time, and then the Jews don't have enough majority to go back. And they've got to make another vote. They've got to have a two-thirds of majority in order to get back. And they're voting for that thing. And Miners Hog, and this Miners Hog, and this bird has lived through this whole thing. He even went and talked to Hitler for World War II a couple of times, met with him, and his staff. And Miners Hog, the first time he met Hitler, he said he really impressed me. But he said, I noticed when you said the Jew, he got rabid and began to foam at the mouth. The next time he met Hitler, right before the war broke out, he said, I've changed my mind about Hitler. He's going to have his war, and he's going to have it. He said, he's a mad dog, and he's going to drag the whole world in the war with him if we don't stop him. He said, I should have shot him. He said, I had my pistol on me in the house with, when I met with him and von Papen and some of his other... He, he had a chance to kill Hitler. He didn't do it, but he said, later, I wish I'd done it. He's a character, that guy. Minor Sagan, when he comes to that room, here's Hitler... Here's Hitler with his boys there, all his friends, Goering and Himmler and the rest of them in the room. They come in, 
he comes in the room and they all go, Heil Hitler! And Meinhard you know, don't know what to do. He used to shake a hand, you know. Up steps Hitler in front of him like this, and Hitler stands up, and Hitler does it, and says, Heil Hitler. When he does that, Meinhard Sagan says, Heil Meinhard Sagan. <laughs> and nobody in the room laughed, boy. Nobody laughed. Everybody just sat there with his face like stone, man. Well, he could have killed him, but he didn't do it. Got out. Then it ended, and they had a vote in the UN for the Jew going back, and they didn't get it the first time. And about that time, the Mossad, that's M-O-S-S-A-D, that's Jewish secret police. And believe me, a Jewish secret police will have more information in a day than the FBI has got in 35 years. And the Mossad phones up Rothschild, and then they get a hold of a Rockefeller in New York. And they say, Rocky, <laughs> we got the goods on you, and you helped Hitler out during that whole war right. with plenty of stuff, and your buddies down in South America all backed you up because they were Catholic, and we got the goods on them. And if you don't do something to influence that vote, we're going to flush the chain. <laughs> and old Rocky gets on the cable grab with a long-distance phone. He phones up the heads of Honduras and Guatemala and Brazil, and Colombia, and Venezuela, and he puts the pressure on. And it must have worked, because the next time the vote came through, five nations that voted against the Jew abstained, and that helped the majority, and two nations that voted against the Jew voted for the Jew. And boy, there's some scenes on this world, the television will never show you what they are, in that, when that thing came around in the, in the Council of Security room, they began to take the vote. The guy stepped up there and put his hand in a jar for Guatemala to pull out the vote, and as he put his hand in, some lady up there in the oh, well, balcony, some Jewish woman, hollered something. I should have bought that book with me to quote it exactly. That thing was uh, Yeshua something. What she said in Hebrew was, save us Jesus. But she said, Yeshua, Yahshua, because that's Joshua's name in the Old Testament. And if a Jew's going to say, if he's going to say, Jehovah saves, he'd say, Jehoshua. Our word is Jesus. That's the Greek. The Greek means, Je Jesus means Jehovah saves. The J-E is an abbreviation for J-H. Jah, Yah, yeah. Jesus means Jehovah saves. And that woman up screams up there in the balcony. Just one voice. All those people there. And what she cries is, Jesus, save us. <laughs> of course, to her, she's not saying that. She's saying, Jehovah, save us. Because they're God, Jehovah. But ain't that a wow one? And up comes the vote, Guatemala for Israel. <laughs> and they get the vote. So back they go. And boy, when they go back, the British says, well, if they're coming back, we're getting out. And out hauls the British people. And in come the Jew. And the Jew comes in, he comes in like this, and boy, when he comes in here along this beach like this, five Muhammad nations hit him. Five of them. Coming in like that. Iraq and Egypt and Syria and Iran and one other, they come in and hit him like that. In comes that Jew and nine this is like I'm using this map up from seventy three, but I'm sure what happened in nineteen forty eight when the Jew landed. And that Jew comes there and lands there. He's outnumbered. He's out-equipped. And it's a miracle of God. He had made a beachhead. And about the time those Muhammads all come in, you have some Palestinians living in here like this. They're about, they say, there's about a million of them. That is Arabs. And 600,000 leave. And about 300,000, 400,000 stay because they're not worried about the Jew. They're going to live with the Jew. Exist with him. They're kinfolk, they're cousins. Isaac is the head of one of them, and Ishmael's the other. Ishmael's Isaac's brother. And there's no reason why they shouldn't get along together, but boy. But he said, Cast out the bond woman and her son, shall not be here with my son Isaac. That's that's Galatians, New Testament. See, you thought you were going to get away, didn't you? It'd just be all Old Testament. New Testament. Galatians 4, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman, the Egyptian, land of Ham, 
and her son, Ishmael, Muhammad, the seventh from Ishmael. For the bondwoman shall not be bondwoman, her son will not be heir with my son Isaac, the Jew. You know what that means? It means I'm in a mess, because I believe the book. It means I'm standing here and I'm saying, I will now tell the President of the United States and Congress what to do. Well, who are you? I'm the Lord's junkyard dog. Who are you? <laughs> I'm a Baptist preacher down in Pensacola. That book says, take all of Ishmael's descendants and run them out of Palestine. I'll say, well, who the, do you think you are talking to us that way? <laughs> I'm a Bible believer. I know what that book says. It says, take that bomb woman or son and get him out. It don't say get there and talk with them peace summits and treaties. In they come. Now listen. Before they come in, you know what they broadcast all over here to their own people? You get out and evacuate now. We'll give you two days to get out. And if we come in there and find any of you there, we'll hang you as traitors. Ain't that a fine way to treat refugees? They threatened to kill their own people if they didn't get out. The Jews didn't drive them out. The Mohammedans drove them out. 600,000 left. Then after that mess was over, two and a half million came back. And when they talk about Palestinians, now they're talking about three million people. Well, they weren't Palestinians. They weren't born there. They weren't raised there. They came in across from here. Across this, because... All this belongs to them over here. Or they go slip across Jordan like that, and they're on the West Bank, and building up a state over here. And you know who comes over when they come over? The Palestinian Liberal Organization, terrorists. Al-Fatah, terrorist organization. The Hezbollah, terrorist organization. The Hamas, terrorist organization. al fayadeen and the Intifada, the uprising. In plain words, a Palestinian state, brethren, is five terrorist groups organized as a government. And I don't want to go back to the room tonight and hear on the boob tube and hear all this crap about the Jews, need, the Palestinians need their own state, need to have their own state. Yeah. President Bush says, yes, we should give them a Palestinian state. And then the war against terrorism, America strikes back. Don't bore me to death, okay? You give that bunch of Palestinian state, they get all the land the Jew didn't get when he came in. And when that Jew came in, he got this land right here. In 48, right up in there, right through here, about in there, and he got just got to Jerusalem, just got there, just got right up to it, right there, and when he got right there, the UN said, "Ha ha ha! ha, ha careful, careful! That's the uh, holy ground. That's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and Holy Mary, Mother of God." Pope says that's his city over there. Don't don't go in there. And stopped them right there. About the time they got there, just about to go into that place, peace talks. Count Bernadotte of Swede. What would a Swede be doing down there in the Middle East talking to Arabs and Jews? What would a Swede know about them? And down comes Bernadotte down there and says, I'm going to intervene for the UN. And the Stern gang says, no, sir, buddy, we're getting the contract on you. And they blew his brains out. And it's a good thing they did. And it's too bad they didn't do it earlier. <laughs> Coming down there to keep that Jew out of his capital, of his own state, that God gave him. That's your UN. Daniel says, when the Antichrist comes, he'll divide the land for gain. And they're going to split this place up and give it their own bunch. Now, there's what that Jew had when he came in in 1948. He had that. And... This area here now is called occupied territory. And to make you think that should be given back to the refugees, the part they conquered from, you see. I don't know a lot about a lot of things, but I was raised in military maps, military history. I never heard of a war where the loser dictated terms of the winner. That's something brand new. I never heard of that before. The guy loses, and he says, now we got to get back all the land we lost, although we attacked you first. When they came in, they attacked them, and they lost the land. And the U.N. meets, says, now give it back to them. Why? 
I didn't. Really, I didn't see Germany sit down in 1948 and said we get Poland and Austria back and Czechoslovakia back because we attacked them and lost. You know, somebody boy, they they got one oar in the water. <laughs> All right, so here in 1948, you come to this Jew like this and get this stuff right here, and then this is called the East, the West Bank. That's news, news media stuff. Come on now. Did you ever go sit down the bank of a river to go fishing? Did you ever sit down the river bank? Yeah. Tell me something. Was it 20 miles wide, 80 miles long? You know why they call it the West Bank? So you make you think it's attached to Jordan, so you'll think it belongs with this. After giving that away, that's the news media. If you know, if I could, if I could just quit reading, I'd be a uh, respectable fellow. I mean, really, honest to God, I'd be a normal human being if I could just quit reading. Really, if I just quit reading about four or five months, I'd be a normal human being. I wouldn't get upset like this. But the more I read, the madder I get, because uh, I've got the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Thy word is truth. The Holy Spirit leads in all truth. I read this stuff. Lies, 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 lies. They're going to get you killed. They're going to get you killed. They ain't no West Bank. That's the land of Canaan. Or in they go like that. Now, quickly, what happens after that? Why summit? Oslo summit. Camp David. Blah, 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 blah. Every time they get one of those things to Muhammad and say, well, if you'll give us this, then we'll quit. If you give us this, we'll quit. And each time they're saying, we ain't going to quit, we're going to kill you and wipe you out. I've got 13 statements by 13 Muhammad leaders that say there won't be a Jew left alive. We'll wipe Israel off the map in four days. We'll wipe Israel off the map in seven days. The radio in Baghdad, the radio in Algiers, the radio in Iraq, the radio in Iran during this six-day war that took place is on the radio day and night, night and day, saying, kill the Jews, 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 kill the Jews. What the UN is doing? Saying, I don't retaliate. You'll hurt the peace process. Now, be careful, you know. I mean, give the Afghanistan some food while you're bombing them, you know. Boy, they, 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 they better be glad my old granddad wasn't, isn't still in the War Department. Boy, that kind of stuff to him. You talk about something else. My, my old granddad, if he, 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 uh, if, if he was been alive and they had that mess with Castro down in Cuba, you know what he'd have done? He had a fleet around that island with 16 each cannons. He said, okay, boys, you've got 48 hours to cut the mustard, or here she comes. Down there in the, one of those Central American countries about, uh, oh, about 100 years ago, a missionary was about to get killed, and he wrapped the United States flag around himself. And he said, shoot if you dare. And nobody dared shoot. They wouldn't shoot today. They'd die laughing. <laughs> yeah, man, that's America, the land of the free, the home of the brave. Folks say, well, Ruckman, if you don't like it, why don't you leave it? Because I got here before you did. <laughs> I mean, my bunch that came in were all, listen to me. I know you think it's uh, prejudice, but you'll learn someday. Uh, my bunch that put up the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, were all white. There wasn't a black man there. They were all male. There wasn't a woman there. They were all straight. There wasn't a... Hey, man, don't look at that. Blink at me like that. I'm telling you the truth. Truth? Let's see you make a liar out of me. Come on, show me. Show me. Every one of those fellows was a white male, and he was straight, and every one of them was reading the King James Bible. That's the kind of people who set this country up. Don't tell me to get out. You liberal, you get out. You got, you got here late. <laughs> All right, so what they want to do now is put a Palestinian state over here. In the meantime, pressure till you give in. Pressure till you give in. And the first time they hit American downtown New York, we give in. What a disgusting performance, man. The real trouble is they don't have a Palestinian state. If we just give them a Palestinian state, the trouble will stop. I got news for you. It won't. It won't. Now, Brother White there told you this morning. He's seen the place where the, the American embassy should be. He's seen the place. He told you how big it was. He told you it's been rent paid for how long? 50-year contract. contract. In plain words, our embassy from Washington, D.C., and Republic or Democrat, don't make a difference. If you got a yellow streak in all of them, our, our 
our, our government was told to move the embassy from Tel Aviv, that's on the shoreline, that's up here, that's up here, to Jerusalem in 1997, when Slick Willie was fornicating. <laughs> and he never moved it. And Bush said, if you elect me, one of the first things I'll take care of is get the embassy to Jerusalem. It ain't there yet. You know what he said? He said, let's don't do it. It might aggravate him. You got it anyway. The only thing that men learn from history is men never learn from history. I know a guy. I was about 18 years old. And he went to Czechoslovakia. And he talked a while. When he came back to England, he had a piece of paper in his hand. And they said, what is that, Chamberlain? He said, it's peace in our time. How'd you get it, son? Well, we gave away Austria, and we gave away the Rhineland, and now we just gave away Czechoslovakia. And now we'll have peace. That Jew is going to have to give up Hebron, then the Gaza Strip, then the Golden Heights, then Lake Chinnereth, and then we'll have no. You'll have war. In case of the rain, the war will be held in the auditorium. <laughs> Lock, load, fire. <laughs> I've given give you some good advice. Get your gun. Yeah. And get about a thousand rounds for each one, and don't get so many guns you can't buy ammo for them. <laughs> I mean, people, I, at one time, at one time, I had a, I had a Glock and a match parts of, of German Mauser from World War I, and a 30 6 Springfield from World War I, and an M1, and a carbine 30-30 from World War II, and a 12-gauge shotgun with a gold finger, and a change, changeable barrel gold cup commander 45 that shoot 22s, and two 38s, and a snub nose revolver, and a 22, all that stuff. And I gave most of it away, because I, 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 I finally thought, Kirby, you can't fire five different guns at the same time, man. <laughs> So the best thing you can do, brother, is get, get you about one or two that are really good, you know. Like, a, I, got a, I got a police, uh, you know, a hard rubber ruler. That's a dilly boy. That's like, a, that's like an old-time 30-30 carbine in the Army, except it's made out of stuff that bounce off the pavement, boy, and fire 9 millimeter. And then I got me a Glock. You can put that in the lake three days, take it out and shoot it again. That'll work. And that's 9 millimeter. Then I've got me a, a Derringer, 9 millimeter. Custom made. They don't already sell them, make them 38 to 22, but not 9 millimeter. But that, 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 that Derringer is a beauty, boy. You just cover your hand. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's 9 millimeter. I'm trying to get it down to 9 millimeter and 38 and 22, and that's all. I don't know how I got off on this, but if you've got, if you've got, listen, if you have to get one gun, fella, I can tell you what to get. If you only get one gun, no gun on. If you only get one, tell you what you get. And this don't sound like much, but if you can just get one gun, you try to get you a good single shot or the most fine magazine clip, 22, that'll shoot long rifles or magnums. If you can just get one, get that. You say, why well, you get something heavy now? You get hungry, you blow a squirrel or rabbit all to pieces, man. <laughs> you get a gun that small, you eat birds and squirrels and rabbits and doves, and it'll kill a man. Believe me, it'll kill a man. That's what the mafia uses now. Smart boys. Long rifle. You know, I've sat, I've been back in the back room shaving, and my boy messed around with the gun when he shouldn't have been, 12 years old in the living room, and that thing go off. And that 22 long went across that living room and went through the dining room, went through the dining room wall, and went into the bathroom and through the bathroom wall and out through the bathroom closet door and across the bathroom into the other side. <laughs> That's a good bullet. <laughs> I guess you want, get you want, get you want something like that. All right. So then, and then they get in there and they get this land here and these stuff start and stuff start. And then about that time, the the uh, uh, Muslims decide to attack again. And they attack one time in 1956, another time in 1967, and 1967 that seven that six day war, and the Jews whip them in six days. And they've got, that time, they got these same five nations against them again. But they got some help this time. Meinertzagen's buddies. And Meinertzagen's been over there, driving around with them and shooting at Arabs. <laughs> He's just supposed to be a colonel in the intelligence department. When he gets by a firefight, he gets out and gets him a rifle and throws in a few rounds. 
And when they get over there before that six-day war there, they got a German SS bunch of fellows coming down there. Some of the German SS went to the Arabs because they hated Jews. And some of the German SS, when they saw the films, what Hitler had done, they fell ashamed of themselves and went down to help the Jews. And they got down to Moshe Dayan. They said, Moshe Dayan said, now, do you know how to conduct a view of Blitzkrieg? And he said, no. They said, we'll show you. <laughs> and they showed him. And when that thing opened up, they and those Jews did. They sent what you call a preemptive strike. That means you shoot them before they shoot you. And, and what he did down there, down here, he, 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 he sent in bombers over in Egypt and sent them so low down the radar couldn't pick them up. Had them head chopped getting over in there. And then he had to come there and dump bombs along those runways and killed, knocked out the whole, all Muhammad's Air Force before it ever got off the ground. And then he could clean them out here in the desert and run into them there. And then some of those bombs were beauties. They were, they were, you take a German to fix something like that. Some of those bombs go in the ground, they don't go off for two or three days. And then you get out there and clean up your strip, <laughs> and bam, bam, you go to peace. You know. Look at here, see that? The Jews have gone across that thing in war three times and fought clean to the Red Sea and the canal. And three times the UN has stopped them from going ahead so they could fight another war. The UN is the greatest war-mongering organization that's ever known to man. That fellow was Sadat is in and Nasser in Egypt, and those Jews go across there, and every time they get that canal, stop, 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 ceasefire. Six-day war, here goes that Jew. In there goes that Jew, and he goes into Jerusalem. This thing here is the Muslim quarter up here. This is the Jewish quarter up in here. This is the Armenian quarter down in here. This is the Christian quarter down in here. That wailing wall up along there where that Jew goes. You couldn't get in. And there's the Mosque of Omar, the Dome of the Temple, and the Dome of the Rock sitting up there like that. And that six-day war, they came in there, and they went into the mosque, into the, into the, the Mohammedan quarter, went at all of them. And that time the UN said, stop, stop, and uh, Moshe Dayan said, not yet. Yes, and in they went and took the whole city. Amen. And then Moshe Dayan made one of the greatest mistakes of his life. He said, we're going to let you, Muhammad, still come here to worship, and we won't let our people worship up here, although you must allow them free passage up here. They can walk around. We won't, we won't let our people pray up here on your holy ground. And Sharon went up there and walked across that ground about two years ago, and all hell broke loose. Because the Muhammad said they own the place. They don't own the place. That's the place where you read in Psalm 2, I've set my king upon my holy mountain. <laughs> and you get reading, you get reading over there in in, uh, in Ezekiel chapter, <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 44. You read where the Lord said about this eastern gate over here. He said, "Shut that gate," and he said, "No man to go through that gate or come out of that gate because the prince has come through that gate and gone out of that gate." You know what that means? That means the night the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, he was, well, no, the night before he was crucified, he took his uh, well, uh, buddies and they went out and they crossed the brook Kidron. John 17, he prayed Mount Olivet, you know, and then he's arrested and comes back. And he comes back, they bring him through the eastern gate in the temple area, the Ananias and, Ananias, uh, Ananias and, and uh, Caiaphas, the high priest. He goes right through that gate. And the Lord said, the, the prince went through that gate, and I'm shutting that thing up, and nobody's going to go through the thing until the prince comes. Yes. And when the prince comes, Zechariah 14, he lands on the Mount of Olives. Amen. Zechariah 14, Acts chapter 1. Gets down off his horse, puts his foot down the ground. When he puts that foot down the ground, wham, the thing splits. Amen. And he gets back on the horse. And he says, saddle up, <laughs> guns up. <laughs> And in they go, you're, you, 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 you. If you don't know how to ride a horse, you better learn how to ride one because you're going to have to ride one. And you're going to go right through that eastern gate, right slap through that thing, and the fact that that thing is cemented shut ain't going to hurt you a bit. And that's Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Oh, now about near the end now. Here's the Yom Kippur War, 1973. In 1973, they picked a holiday to attack them and attacked them again. And the Jews beat him again. 
Every time they tangle, the Jews beat them. And every time the Jew gets almost ready to get something done, the UN steps in and says, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> you know, and, the, and now you've got Bush doing it, you know. Oh, stole the phone, give them what they want. Now, you know why this thing here we're talking about is never going to work out any other way and the Bible works it out? Because years and years and years and years and years ago, there was a shepherd out in the backside of a desert in a backslidden condition. And he's walking around, and pretty soon he saw a bush on fire. And somebody could have sworn he'd just seen heat waves go up. But he'd been out there 40 years. He knew more than they did. And he walked up that burning bush, and he caught that burning bush, and he was afraid to look up there. And he looked up and looked back down again, and a voice came out of the bush and said, Take your shoes off your foot, because the ground you stand on is holy ground. A jihad is a holy war for Allah. Holy Father is a big, fat, piggish, pot-headed, wine old Pollock over in Rome. And they take this word holy and put it on something that's supposed to make it holy. This is called the Holy Bible. You know why it's called the Holy Bible? Because in Romans chapter 1 it says, Holy Scriptures. They call the same, another book the Holy Koran. Is it holy? No. Why, if, it, if it's not holy, what you call it didn't make a difference. It either is or it ain't. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Holy beads. Holy water. Tit tat toe. Free in the world. Hail Mary, full of grapes. Blessed be the fruit of the loom. <laughs> That's not a bad fruit. <laughs> they think because you put the word holy in something, that makes it holy. It don't make it holy. But boy, when God says, take your shoes off your feet, that ground you stand is holy ground, you better look out. Because that's right where 3,000 people got killed when the law was given. Most came out off the mount, that golden calf, and 3,000 people got slaughtered right there. They made that ark. That ark went here, up to Kadesh Barnea. Who reads the Old Testament? Numbers 13, 14. You know why I'm making this trip around here? Because Solomon says in the Chronicles, all the places where the Ark of the Covenant has gone is holy. It's in Chronicles. Forty years. Around here, up through here, Og, King of Bashan, Battle of Edrei, Golden Heights, Transjordan, over. Philistines got the Ark of the Covenant down in Gaza, Gaza Strip, and they got Ship with them rods, and God died, 20,000 of them. Ark was taken back up and put in Jerusalem, and the ark was in Jerusalem when uh, Nebuchadnezzar came in. And he said, all the places that ark went are holy. You see what I did up there? You know how many people are going to get killed there? 200 million people are going to get killed right there. And they're all going to be UN members. Take your Bible and turn to Revelation. Revelation chapter 14. They're going to get slaughtered. Make it 16. Make it 16. Get 16 in one hand and get 9 in the other. Revelation. Now this has been a very brief survey, but you've been real good now. You've been up this thing about almost two hours. We'll I have to stop here in a minute, but you're just getting a sketchy outline. Tell what you do. Go home after you leave this place tonight, get you out a, a, a highlighter, and go through your start this time at Genesis. And this time when you come through, don't mark anything except the places where God said, I've given you this land, I've given you this land, I've given you this land. And there'll be more places there than that than there are on the plan of salvation in the New Testament. It's a history book. It's about a piece of ground. Don't you see that? It's about a piece of dirt. I'm glad I got into the goodies. I mean, thank God Christ died for me. I'm, that's great, boy. I'm glad I'm on the right side, man. I don't want to be on that mess when it comes down. But I got better sense to think the Bible's written for me. God isn't interested in me as much as he's interested in his own son. People, the greatest day in God's life is not the day that Christ died for your sins. 
That's the greatest day for you. Right. Amen. 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 Now, if you, were, if you were the Lord, would you call that a great day? The day that sinners strip your son naked and made fun of him and nailed him? Would that be the day you'd call the day in your calendar? I know the Lord's mind. I know what he's got in mind. He wants to see the day his son comes back here Amen. and gets what he worked for and earned. Amen. And I'm with him. I'm, I want to see it. I want to see it. Amen. I want to see it more than anything. Amen. I want to have him come back and I'm going to say, I told you so. I told you so. Look here. See, see right there. I told you so. Right there. See right there. <laughs> you know, we, we preachers, we get preaching. I've been preaching for Christ for 53 years. I've never even seen him. Sometimes I feel like a fool, you know. I get bragging about so I've never even seen him. I want to see him. Not when I see him, I'm going to say, I told you so, I told you, I told you, man. <laughs> uh, Revelation, four, uh, Revelation 16, verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Bless he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together in a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. How many of them? Verse 14, For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles. Oh, there's that charismatic. Which go forth to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle. In case of rain, the world will be held in the auditorium. <laughs> the battle of the great day of God Almighty. That's the day on God's calendar. Revelation 9. Revelation 9, verse 14. Saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Oh, there we are back in Genesis 2. How about that? Right back where you started from. Right where it began. In the last book in your Bible. One book and one theme for 66 books. A piece of real estate in the Middle East. Verse 14, Loose the four angels which were bound the great river Euphrates, and the four angels were loose which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year to slay the third part of men. The third part of men? Well, what is the population? Is five, six billion? Six billion. There went two billion dead men. That's God's idea of, God's idea of a house cleaning. Nice fellow, isn't he? The Lord, nice, gentle, sweet character. Knock out two billion people just like you'd swallow a fly. Blip. I mean it. I mean it. Amen, brother. He'll kill five million, never blink. You say who? The one that saved you. The one that died on the cross. The one that, you know, we pray and sing about. Five million people, it's like that. There go two billion right there. One swat man. He's going to kill more than got killed in all the wars that have been fought in, uh, since, the, since the birth of Christ. There haven't been two billion casualties in all the wars that have been fought. But that ain't all. Here come the troops. <laughs> Verse 16, the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. That's 200 million horsemen armed. And they get wiped out. Two billion, two hundred million people just going like that. <laughs> Over what? A guy lying on the ground that's asleep. <laughs> and the Lord said, there's no conditions attached to this land. You're going to get the land. And if I've got to kill two billion, two hundred million men to give you the land, I'll just swat them out like a fly swatter. Oh, we've got to close. Let's close with uh, Isaiah 63. That's a nice, sweet, cheerful piece of music. <laughs> you know what I heard a missionary say one time? His name was Fieldhouse, Marvin Fieldhouse. And Marvin Fieldhouse said, he, he'd been a missionary to Japan for years. You know what he said? He said, it's the duty of every Christian, every age which he finds himself, that is a Christian born in the first, second century, third or fourth, fifth or sixth, no matter what century he's born in, it's the duty of every Christian in every century in which he finds himself to find out 
what is the spirit of that age and move directly against it. That's what he said. Now, I'm good at that, see. I'm good at negative, see. I mean, I've, I can handle that. I can say no to people easy. It's hard for some of you. You're, you're nice folks. You're normal, you know. It's always been easy for me to make enemies. I never worry about it. Some of you, you, you awful touch you. And it's, you're probably right and I'm probably wrong, but it's, it's got the advantages, you know. I mean, uh, folks talk about people hurting their feelings. Uh, nobody's ever really hurt my feelings. Now, I've had God hurt me a couple times real bad. But I always take it from Him. I don't figure you have anything to do with it. It's kind of a dehumanizing kind of a thing. That's the way it is. I'm used to being cussed out, lied about, and criticized, and slandered. I'm used to it. I'm comfortable with it. You know, so I feel at home in that kind of an atmosphere. I mean, really. Like, really, man. My wife tries to help me, you know. She's a good woman. She's normal, you know, my wife. And she tries to help me, you know. But it's, a, it's kind of a chore, you know. She, I'll come back and I'll say, well, what's this stuff about, I like your hat or I like your tie, you know, that kind of stuff. She said, well, that's compliments. And I said, well, what am I supposed to do when they say that? I like your hat. So you're supposed to say, thank you. And I say, for what? <laughs> I mean... I'm going to put on the hat because you like it. I ain't dressing up for you, you know. She says, well, there's a compliment. You know, I like your tie. You want to buy it? <laughs> and uh, when, when I get embarrassed, when I get embarrassed is when people treat me good because they don't know how to react. I know what, I, I, you're supposed to react some way, but I can't, I, don't, I can't react right for some reason. I just get embarrassed something. And I used to preach a lot of youth, a lot of youth camps. I still preach a couple every year, but I used to preach about four a year. When I'd come up there to talk, the kids always applaud me, you know. And I'd tell the preachers, don't, don't applause. I don't want any applause. Cause I'd rather have you boo me than applaud me. So up those big camps, the next few years, I came back to the South Dr. Ruckman, about a thousand kids would go, boo, you know. <laughs> Which I enjoyed, you know. I said, that gives you a comfortable feeling, you know, makes you feel home. But I bet some visitors wondered, what in the world, man? I bet some visitors. Because I was speaking right, boo! <laughs> now you take this, this negative thing we're on here tonight. It doesn't bother me a bit. I'm comfortable there. I mean, I read a... I teach a, I teach a course down in the school called Advanced Theology. I teach them abnormal psychiatry. Clinical, clinical psychology. I mean, various kind of catatonic schizophrenia, you know, hebrephrenic schizophrenia, all that kind of junk. And, and one of the things I teach them is the number of points you have to have before you blow your brains out <laughs> in depression, see? Folks talk about stress. Well, I've got a stress chart there. You give yourself 50 points if your wife left you, you know, and 50 points if a child just died, or 100 points if your mother just died. And then when you get so many points, you know, you're about ready to blow your brains out. Now, I think it allows you 300 points before you pull a trigger. <laughs> And I looked at that one day, and I remember one time, at one time, I had 400 of them <laughs> ready. <laughs> and so, uh, it, with me, I've always lived in kind of a base level, you see. And that's, uh, that comes from infantry. That comes from infantry. I still pick up a cup of coffee like this, you know, when I drink it. You see what's that? You're warming your hands around the cup, because it ain't going to cold. It's cold weather. You're drinking it in. You're outside. You, of course, it's stupid. You're in a restaurant, but you got your hand like this. And so this negative stuff I'm giving you doesn't bother me. It makes me feel fine. And uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, folks, I'm not, but you believe it or not, I'm not pessimistic. I'm very optimistic about myself because I know how I'm going to wind up. I'm gonna, if, the, if this book is right, I'm going to wind up just like Jesus Christ. Well, ain't that pretty good? Yeah. Well, I'm going to get depressed about it. Yeah. Please don't, don't accept me. Oh, nuts. Listen, God hath made us accepted in the beloved. Yeah. And if Jesus Christ has accepted you, what do you give a flip if anybody accepts you or not? Yeah. And if your maker accepts you, what do you care about the rest? Well, let's read Isaiah 63 and we'll knock this thing off here. Who is this that cometh from Edom? Beats the fire out of me. 
<laughs> Who comes from Edom? Well, I know where Edom is right down here. Somebody's coming from here. I read in Judges, they started there. Somebody's coming through like that. Well, I, there's only one way they can go. They're going to be like Joshua. Joshua went in like that and crossed right there. And somebody's coming through here just like this, and they're going to land the Mount of Olives right there. So what's his name? Joshua. That's the Old Testament word for Jesus. Joshua. All right, who's this that's coming from Edom? With dyed garments from Bozrah. That's in Edom. Question. Who is this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? Answer. I that speak in righteousness? Yes. Who could that be? Yes. <laughs> Mighty to save? Yeah. Well, that couldn't be the first coming. He didn't come from Edom. He was born in Bethlehem. Two, wherefore art thou red in thine apparel? You're soaking red. And thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat. Well, back in those days, they have a big thing like, like an angel food cake pan made out of cement, and they dump all them grapes in there, and the guy get in there, and he'd take his robe and tuck it up under his belt, gird it with his loins, and then he'd step around and stomp out those grapes, bare feet, clean the feet before they get in, and then stomp around their bare feet and mash out them grapes. And he says, you look like a guy that's been stomping around grape juice, got grape juice all over you. Verse 3, answer, I have trodden the wine press alone. You're behind him. He's up in front. And of the people, there was none with me. He does all the stomping. For I will tread them in mine anger. Boy, what a nasty character you are. I'm going to step on people. Stomp on them. Not a fine fellow? Preach that in the First Baptist Church of Charlotte and see how it goes over. <laughs> they don't believe this book. They read the parts of this book they like. Three, I will tread them in mine anger and trample them. In my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I'll stain my raiment. Now, who's that talking? That's the one the sound document is singing about tonight. You know? To put the finishing touches on it? <laughs> well, as he put the finishing touches on that bunch right there. <laughs> and instead of dying for them, instead of dying for them, you know what he does? He's stomping them to death. That's, you know, away in a manger, no crib for his rest. The little Lord Jesus laid down. Sweet baby, huh? <laughs> you see, they like that baby. That's cute. Isn't that baby cute? This fellow here ain't cute. <laughs> For the day of vengeance, uh oh, is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed hath come. Six, and I will tread down the people of mine anger and make them drunk in my fury, and I'll bring down their strength of the earth. Blah! That's what's going to happen. All right, folks, now it's real simple. That book is true or it's not. If that true book is true, it's a history book. And the fact that you believe it or don't believe it is immaterial. If it's history, it happened. And if it's history, it's going to happen. And if that book is true, that book says about history that your end, if you're saved, is to wind up in glory with the one that wrote that book and be a sinless person just like Jesus Christ. And if you're not saved, and that book is true, you're headed for a lake of fire, and you're going to burn, and you ain't going to quit burning. And that ain't religion. It's history. It tells you what's going to happen to you when you die. Now, me, you know me. All my blue chips are right there. I, I'm betting every word of it's true. And if it's not, I'm willing to take a chance. God knows I couldn't bet anything else. All right, brother, come ahead and throw the service here. Lord, you've been real.